Hello, gamers. Welcome to the No Clip Podcast and non gamers. You're also welcome. Or Crewcast, sorry, not the podcast. This is the Crewcast. This is episode 169. Nice. But what's not so nice is that Daniel Dwyer is not here, as you can tell. If you don't uh, follow us on Twitter, you may have uh, not seen that Danny had a uh, emergency medical situation while at GDC filming something. So uh, he is off for a little while waiting for surgery and then going to be in recovery for the time being. So he will not be on the podcast, but we will be here uh, keeping your ears alive on Fridays and Saturdays and whenever you listen to this. Um, But we miss Danny dearly. We hope he's doing well. Hope he's keeping well. Hope he's in good spirits. I know that uh, there was a lot of work tied into the period of time that him and Jeremy were at GDC. So getting you know, a, an emergency like that is, is costly time wise and also costly for his health. Like it's, it's scary. And like he said in his post on Patreon, the guy is, is partially perhaps uh, overworking himself and that may be part of it. And we'll get into it later. But while I was at PAX, a lot of what I heard from people was, oh, you're from Noclip. Sorry about Danny. And like, so they know how hard we're working and they, and people seriously are, are, are rooting for him. So He'll be okay, but it's, it's you know, it's always sad to see someone on the team uh, going through something like that. But anyway, to get out of the dour mood, uh, I am joined by now returning champion, Frank Howley. Frank, how are you? I'm all, I'm all right in the sense that I'm still suffering from jet lag, but other than that, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. Good, good. Yeah, welcome back from the land of J-Pan. Uh, can't wait to hear about your stories, your your brothel experiences, I'm sure, watching uh, <laughs> women's wrestling. It's going to be a good time when we get to that. Uh, and we're also joined, of course, by the always lovely Jeremy Jane. Jeremy, how's it going? Uh, it's going good. I uh, I had some car trouble up in Mendocino, so I drove back this morning in the rain on the sketchiest road that I've ever seen in California. Uh, but I, oh, did, no. I did not die, and I am not face down in the ocean right now, so all is well. <laughs> That's good. Were you going to get, was the waves just coming up that high? You, you could have just gotten washed into the ocean? No, it's, it's the opposite. It's that the, the cliff is so high and there's no oh, guardrail no. on it and it was pouring rain and there are these, um, I think they're called cow catchers. They're like the metal grates that go across the road. And every time I would hit one, my car would just like power slide. Like I was in fucking Ridge Racer. I was Ridge oh, Racing my all morning. You were initial d your way home. I, was, I almost initial D'd my way into the grave. Mom, if you're listening, <laughs> this is fictional. Holy shit. Yeah, no, you're okay. You're safe. You're still with us. No, no, no water damage to your vehicle. Although I guess that would be the least funny thing to happen to a vehicle that you own in the last also the five least, or six the years. The least thing, the lowest on my list of worries if I fell 100 <laughs> feet into the ocean would be like, oh, man, my car is going to be fucked after this. <laughs> you, I think you would survive. I feel like you're built different enough for that. I thought a lot about it. I thought a lot about if I rolled over the cliff and I survived the fall. First of all, I was like, I was like, should I unbuckle my seatbelt? Because if I go into a roll, maybe I can like jump out the door. And I was like, well, that's not going to happen because I've uh, I'm physic- <laughs> I've spent most of my life sitting in front of a computer. So then I was like, well, if I go over the cliff and I survive the fall, like I won't have cell reception, but maybe I can climb back up the cliff. So I and then like you're you know, when you're driving and your attention snaps back, and you're like, I've just been like on autopilot. I don't even know where I am. And you're like, I've just been in my head. Uh, so I, I but I didn't die. So it doesn't matter. Well, that's good that you 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 came to before it got too bad. <laughs> Snapped back to consciousness <laughs> before I died. I do like the idea that you could just like dive roll out of a car going 100 miles an hour and just. Be I thought okay. it would be like, really cool if I could pull it. In my head, I was like, I could definitely do that. Um, but then I was like, that's one of those delusions. Also, I was thinking how ironic it would be if um if I rolled over a cliff and died because I was so busy ideating on what I would do if I rolled over a cliff to not die. <laughs> It's like bound to happen. You 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 manifested it by thinking about it too much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> before we start talking about video games, we do have to thank the people who keep everything that NoClip does uh, going. That's our patrons. Thank you so much for all of your support. If you'd like to support this podcast and you're not already one of those awesome people, you can fund our documentaries and get access to a bunch of bonuses, including bonus podcast episodes. We did one last week about uh, making a Frankenstein of a first-person shooter. It's a lot of fun. We spent like an hour and a half naming obscure 90s shooters uh and discord access as well if you want to keep up with the conversation you can do so at patreon.com slash no clip and if you want to give all the way to the tippy top of our patreon tiers you can join the list of our battle pass holders harry flanagan battle royale games arno richard matherson james brown mark rojas ryan cobb tucker morgan crimson cyclist sven hooster pez tim robinson forrest pruitt eric hamilton schneider 
he's not here, so we gotta we gotta go all out for this one. Cameron Love! Oh, that was good. That was a new twist on it. Yeah, we had to. I went a little more glam rock on that one. Uh, Zachary Snyder or Snyder, sorry. Uh, Alex Sharp, Alex Goucher, George Zerkotis, Jacob Godserve, Tohir Tiliev, and Ryson. Thank you all so much for your support. You are the best. You keep it all running. You you allow us to uh, to need to go to the doctor sometimes. So so thank you so much. Um, but uh, Jeremy mentioned possibilities of of accidents in, in vehicles with engines. Um, I'm trying to use this as a transition to talk about Boeing airplanes and then get over to Frank. So uh, let's skip the tragedies and go straight to Frank. Frank, how was Japan? Welcome back. I, I Honestly, for the two or three weeks that you weren't on the podcast and I was, I was like, I just want to talk to Frank about how much fun Japan was. Please indulge us. Yeah, uh, it was the best convention I ever went to. It was 10 days long. It was so sick. The dealer's hall was infinite. It was infinite. You had to take trains to get to different booths to get to different. It was amazing. Um, no, legitimately. Yeah, no, Japan. Japan was phenomenal and I'm still tired from it, but I already want to go back. I'm already looking into Tokyo Game Show September uh, 26th through the 28th. There, I'm, I'm like ready to go back. I said this even before I went the first time. I'm ready to go back. Uh, even I'm, I just went for a bike ride like an hour ago, like, and I'm still processing it, still thinking about it. Um, I'm even more obsessed with, uh, re- wrestling, if you can believe it or not. Uh, I am, I, I, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's real. Cause it's something I always imagined I would do one day. Like, I don't know, like by late teenage being obsessed with like animes, Capcom games, uh, Japanese cinema and everything. It was like, oh man, it'd be cool to go to Japan. It'd be cool to go to Japan. And then stuff happened so fast the last few months where all of a sudden it like, I feel like I didn't have time to properly like plan or like maybe like anxiously anticipate. It was just like, I'm doing all this crap. I'm going to go after this. And then I want like, once I was on the plane, it was like, I couldn't sleep for like the, the what 12 hours. Cause I was so excited, just buzzing, still <laughs> looking at like reddits and Twitters and just trying to find like things to do. And like, I didn't really even get much sleep. Cause I would, I would, I would want to wake up as first thing in the morning, go out, get on a train, go somewhere and explore. And like, I feel like I cu- I scratched like ten percent of like things that I would like to do there. Like I I want I want to go back immediately. Um, but yeah, general highlights like there's a lot, and I post a lot of pictures on social media and stuff. But like my favorite thing, and this is like so hyper niche and like, but the thing that was truly like the most exhilarating thing was I went to four wrestling shows. Two nice. was Stardom, one was Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling. The other was like Choco Pro, which is like a super indie promotion that's like. Hyper Joshi, hyper male, also like intergender matches, like very indie, but very fun. But my favorite thing was seeing stardom at Karakin Hall. Karakin Hall is the most famous like wrestling fighting hall in the world. Uh, it's like on the fifth story of like a multi-floor, like, I don't like, like, I don't even know if it's like a shopping building or what, but that arena, it's, it's pretty small and tight, but it's got stadium seating and so sounds and everything echo. So like, Japanese audiences at wrestling shows are pretty reserved, especially compared to how wild and extreme American audiences are. <laughs> um, that like was it as quiet as you were the, saying it was going to be? It was no. So thankfully, it was a little bit more because I realized like on the live streams and stuff, the microphones are directed to the ring. They're not picking up mm. all the arena sounds. So it was a little bit more like that. Like the first show I went to was the opening of this thing called the Cinderella Tournament. It was like a pay per view. So it was in, in the Yokohama Budokan, which is like a could be a pretty big stadium uh, or big arena. And like the audience was like into it, but like it just wasn't super loud. But then the next day at Carrick Hall, it was like it was a sold out show at Carrick Hall. And yeah, it was like that show itself was maybe two and a half hours was nonstop and was like so surreal uh, being there because we were so close. We were on we're on the hard cam the entire show also. Um, and so, yeah, like like. Oh, man, it was. I've been following Stardom for like six months, being obsessed with like all these wrestlers. There's also the brand is going to be splitting. I, I can go so deep into Stardom, whatever. But I loved it, and then seeing more wrestling on top of it, pulling out of wrestling stuff. Like, oh, I can, I can. Talk, I'm, I feel like I'm like wrestling more than video games now. I've been That's like fine. flipped. Um, <laughs> I went to a store called Tutacon, which is the biggest wrestling store in the world. It's a wrestling museum and thrift store where people just sell old wrestling stuff, or you can buy new wrestling, you know, buy wrestling stuff and like. Going there was like it was the coolest store I'd ever been to. I went back by the end of the trip to buy more stuff because I had leftover again, and it's like, wait, I can still buy more crap. Like, and so I went, I went nuts in there, and uh, and then like, so that was cool. But then going into the realm of video game stuff, uh, like I did go to 
Kabukicho or whatever the the Shinjuku the the actual like Yakuza red light district okay. that Yakuza is based on, and that was cool and scary and exciting and everything. But the real cool hidden gem, like an hour south of Tokyo, was Yokohama, and that's like my favorite city. That like to me. Tokyo was like LA and Yokohama was like San Diego. A little bit outside like the central touristy stuff. It's still a it's still you're near Tokyo, so it's still nice. But that's where the Gundam factory was. So I gotta see the giant massive Gundam and oh, all that shit. stuff. But yeah, right outside the Gundam factory is this little park. And that park is where the the Leica Dragon, the Lost Judgment, um, uh Yakuza 8, like the park from Yakuza is there. And as soon as I was there, I was like, that was so that like it's so dumb, but that was like one of the most exciting things being in this park that was modeled in a video game. Um, and and there was so many times throughout Japan where I was just constantly like, oh, this is like Yakuza, this is like Persona, like very <laughs> surreal. Even seeing like the lock coin lockers in the subways, just thinking like, oh, it's Yakuza. Like, oh, I don't know. I, there must be keys all over the city. I need yeah, to find to open these up, it, or a child it, it, in one of them. Yeah, exactly. It was <laughs> it was very like magical and surreal, and like I still miss the jingles. I miss the public transportation, the trains, being able to take trains anywhere. That was like another thing I would do is I would have like one thing on my agenda I wanted to do that day, or a random wrestling show. So we we would just take the train to that area and either kill time before the wrestling show or after, and just like wander the streets, find stuff. I, I did go to lots of book offs. I did explore Akihabara and go through all like the vintage shops. I discovered there's a there's a chain of stores called like Mandarake, Mandarake, where people sell everything. So you have shops dedicated to like 70s and 80s TV, shops dedicated to wrestling, shops dedicated to like Boy Love Yaoi, Dojinji, shops dedicated to like sports cards, sports dedicated to like cinema posters, and like it's like everything, seven floors, cosplays, and it was like this is insane, like. It was incredible. And I, I went to so many and like, yeah, it was all, I don't know. I, I can keep talking infinitely, but like, Dude, no, I'm, it sounds I'm, like I want to hear, I wanna hear as much about Japan as you want to tell us. I'm yeah. curious Honestly, if you got yeah. any good, like, um, like video game related, like statuettes or copies of games or like stuff that so, you picked up at old game stores. So the coolest thing is the store called beep. And like, I like, there's a language barrier. So I don't know if we could ever do a documentary, but if like the, the archipel, like if anyone can cut or maybe don't blow the secret. <laughs> Beep is a store in Akihabara. It's a basement. It's a store dedicated to PC98 software and hardware. Whoa. So you walk in and it's all that like 80s chiptune playing. They have old PCs running. They have a whole shelf dedicated to, um, was it Tokimeki Memorial? Yeah, yeah. You can buy Tokimeki Memorial towels, pins, buttons. Holy they have shit. a wall of like hardcore PC98 adult games. They they sell, they were selling like Sailor Moon Hentai for like $3 each. Oh my was God, like, dude. What the hell? Like, there's also like Dreamcast figure, like just it, like all this crazy stuff there. The wall is illustrated with like autographs from like PC98 artists and game developers and all this stuff. It's just it, and, and like just piles of broken PS2s and old. It was like the coolest shop. That was another place I went back to. Uh, also independently from Book Off is Hard Off, which is like their hardware store. Yeah, it's called oh. Hard Off, and and they play a music, they play a song when you walk in. That's so like it just loops over and over, but it's the best song ever. Um, but Hard Hard Off is where they sell like hardware, so it's like buckets of like cell phones, cameras, PS2s, games, uh, instruments, everything. Like it was just what I loved also too is like every shop is so is is so. I don't know everything is like a pop culture museum. I was just walking around and like, I don't know. It was uh, like I took I took over a thousand photographs, nice. over a thousand photographs. Yeah, constantly, constant, constantly. Like it was nonstop euphoria. Like, yeah, even talking about it, I'm buzzing. Like I just I'm ready to go again. Like convention. I don't care about conventions anymore, but I do want to hear about like Pax East because that's there's a scene, there's a vibrant, but like WonderCon's happening next week, and it's like I don't I don't care. I, I just want to go back to like Japan or go to the source. So like. Uh, other video game stuff like there was like a final fantasy 7 pop-up so i got like so like i got like a big plush size t tifa or tifa i don't know i call her tifa and then i also got like a micro polygon oh, hell <laughs> like, yeah. like a ps1 tifa. tifa yeah yeah so like every you go you get great cute stuff like yeah it was it, it was like what i also like about shopping in tokyo is there's a million pop-ups so there was like a, i went to a persona 3 cafe there was like a free run cafe whatever like the hot property of the month is like there's pop-up shops i went to also back to wrestling territory. There's a bar uh, hosted by uh, DDT Wrestling, where every night different wrestlers are the bartenders. Holy shit! So that, that's oh why I went for my birth. Yeah, that's why I went for my birthday. So it's these big jack dudes Dude, like you, you serving don't need a drinks and also that bar. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah, and, 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 and like 
they're just playing wrestling matches on the thing. And, 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 uh, I also realized like, oh, most of the clientele going there aren't like dorky male wrestling fans. And so it was all women going to like talk to the male wrestler. Oh, hostesses. And I was like, and I was like, oh, this, oh, this is a male hostess bar. Oh, and like, I'm sitting there beaming, like there's wrestling on the wall. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, they're, oh, they like, I did not return. I did not with the vibe of this, but whatever. But I did go to the muscle girl bar also. Nice. And Ooh. that was incredible. They, I also did not know they straight up do strip, like strip pool routines too. Um, that I don't, I don't know if they show that stuff on Twitch too, but it was cool. I really recommend it. It's like a Vegas show. I went like my first or second night where I was jet lagged, so I was so dead, but like it was very fun. Um, again, just getting around was very easy. I feel like I didn't indulge in food as much because uh. like, honestly, I was on my feet so much. I was walking. I, I, I did have Japanese McDonald's. No, I, I did. I, I, a teriyaki burger. Hell yeah. But was it better? Near my... Yeah, no, the the French fries are were awesome. <laughs> Teriyaki burger is kind of sloppy, which is weird. I felt more like a Carl's Jr. item or something, but whatever. Um, what I liked about um, near my hotel in Rapongi was just a random hole in the wall sushi place where I, I went twice and we just get. I sound so dorky now, being like, I ordered stuff in the Kasi. No, um, <laughs> but no, I just like I don't know. Just give me the best sushi, and it was the best sushi. And right now, the the U.S. dollar is so strong against mm-hmm. the yen that it felt like everything was cheap. Yeah. Like, I don't know, and, and so. I also say like I you know I, I there was times where I'm doing interactions and I would like be self-deprecating and say like oh baka gaijin like apologizing but what I learned is like it, with the language barrier and everything like irony does not translate so there were a few times where like why are you calling yourself dumb like like and I'm, and I'm like and I'm like oh no I'm trying to like make a joke because it would take me so long to count coins but people were so nice like I had. I forget there's a term for it. There's a there, like it's people on Reddit will come talk about like this this old salary man punched me getting on the train. But like I didn't have any rude experiences like that. I think I had like one stiff shoulder, but like other than that, like it was like people were so friendly. I was also pretty conscientious, like with my backpack and stuff. And like the first few days were real was me, was me. I was gonna say like learning the culture. It was me like learning how to get around. But by the end, I felt very comfortable taking subways everywhere. And uh yeah, I'm still like buzzing on it. Like it's it I don't know. It, it, it like it's so goddamn cool. I just want to go. I want to go back. I'm ready to go back. And so I don't know. Yeah. Even, even like by the end, like I going into it, I had three wrestling shows reserved, but by the end I was comfortable. I was like, I want more. And so I went way off the tracks to this small wrestling warehouse called Shinkiba first ring. But that's also where they do death match wrestling and stuff like that. And it's like, so now when I go back, I want to see death match wrestling. Like there's so much more, more to do. I didn't even like mess around with the arcades. I did pop in around one to take a look. One thing I thought was funny. They had crane games with like BB guns and like uh, airsoft guns. Oh, that's so awesome. You see, a cr- you see a crane game. And it's all like guns and machine guns, but airsoft. <laughs> there was also a uh, like crane game that had monster energy drinks. Nice. Uh, just, just like surreal things like that. And like. It was also fun doing gift shopping for friends, finding stuff and thinking like, oh, this person would like that. There was, oh, there was like a One Piece store. Uh, the, the coolest thing I went to is a place called Diver City, which just the name itself sounds so cool. Diver City. It's like a six floor shopping mall, which felt very much like an American mall. Like there was a Vans and things like that. But that's where they had the One Piece store. They had like any property you can think of they had a dedicated store for. On the top floor was like a whole giant Gundam store. Uh, you could also, you could buy a Gundam and then they had like, areas where you could build and paint your Gundams it, it would too and have like paint kits and stuff. And it's like, this oh is God. really cool. Um, and then in that area is yeah, where that Shinkiba first ring was just walking in any direction was really cool. And then, yeah, I, I abused the hell out of seven 11 for like a doll. You can get like an incredible chicken sandwich or I was going to say, you still had to eat while you were there. Yes. I ate and so you must many, have eaten uh, that stuff. Uh, this was yeah. when Danny and I went, it was like, I, I don't even know. 2017. It was like a long time ago now, but, um, I just like one of the most distinct memories for whatever reason. Like I saw so many things that blew my mind, but the thing I always think about is like five dollar curry noodles from Seven Eleven. I don't know why. It's just like I, it's like one of the warmest, coziest memories is just being like coming back from a night of having drinks with friends and then being like, oh, I get to have my like little curry noodles in my tiny <laughs> hotel room, dude. I want to go back, Frank. We should fucking we should go together, dude. No, I you have to see Beep again. Like I think that is the coolest underground thing. Uh, is is that PC ninety eight store? I mean, like all game stores were cool. Like I like again, I, I talked. About, I posted like in our thing. I, I found like Spider Japanese Spider Man two for like twenty dollars. <laughs> it was very funny to see like Western AAA games be discounted so hard. <laughs> like I saw Skull and Bones extremely cheap. Like no one. It's just so funny seeing like what games flood the used stores and things like that. Like. So I bought Japanese Heavy Rain on PS3 for like four dollars. I got a Shin Kamen Rider game. Yeah, I, I did get Spider-Man 2. Nice. Uh, it was just fun loading up. I wanted to get more stuff, but I was already so conscious of like, oh my backpack, I'm not gonna be able to fit it. Like, even one funny random bonus thing was like, go leaving the airport, leaving going back home. I had a direct flight out of LA, out of yeah, like Tokyo to LAX. 
And so I already checked my big bag in, but there was a 7-Eleven by our gate and the 7-Eleven sold like super cheap whiskey. And like, like when there's all the customs things. So I was like, wait a minute. Okay. So I loaded up on like Suntory and more stuff. There's a, the fact that there's a 7-Eleven in an in airport was so cool. Um, yeah, it was, again, I, I don't know. I, I, I adored it. I'm still like excited. Also like one of my favorite wrestlers, I got to meet, uh, again, this hyper specific stuff, but like at the stardom show, there's a wrestler named Mayu Iwatani who is like the icon of stardom. Super cute. She's promoting her new movie coming out in May. And they had a thing where like, oh, if you buy a movie ticket, you can you can meet Mayu Iwatani. So I pull out my yen. I'm fumbling around. And like the girls, she's saying, you know, speaking Japanese, everyone. And, and I, I'm in line like, uh, uh, here you go. She gives me a movie ticket. And I, I just say, thank you. Thank you. I love you in English. And I just and I, I don't I just I, but it was so dorky, but I don't care. I got to say I love you to Mayu Iwatani. That's, so um, dude, that's awesome. And then and then during during start of matches, like wrestlers come out, they do the, the craziest intros. They're waving at the audience and stuff like that. And then like as they're about to set, start the match, like there's like this 10 second buffer where like everyone's getting ready. The ref's about to count down. And it's in those 10 seconds. Every like photographer and fan is like screaming for their favorite. Like it's basically idol stuff. They're screaming for their favorite idol. And like. So during all those shows, it was constantly like me, like cheering for my favorites and like. Again, it's so du- it's so dark, but it's very sweet. Where it's like, yeah, I got like Mina Shirakawa was this wrestler I adore who's now starting to blow up in the states. And like, there's a like at both shows, I got to cheer for Mina, and she looked at me, I got to take a picture. And like, it's so dorky, but it's like that's this rush that's so exciting. Uh, having like watched Stardom for so long and just being like, man, one day it'll be cool to go there and then to cheer for them. And like, even like d- wrestlers will come out during their like factions matches on the ring side to support them. And like, I was, I was just couldn't resist being like, Oh, sorry, I come <laughs> like waving. And they would look at me confused. Like, why is there a white guy? In the office? Like, <laughs> I don't know, but How do you I don't know. There? So I, you know, Sardom girls noticed me. Also TJPW, which is the other pr- promotion, Tokyo Joshi pro wrestling. They actually do meet and greets. And so it was funny because I spoke to three different wrestlers and the first one, Palm Harajuku speaks a little bit English. So I was able to have a very basic conversation with her. And that was like really sweet and adorable. So then I went to the next wrestler. I want to speak to Yuki Kamafuku. And I went, I'm like, I have a very basic, like, hi, hello, like trying to keep it easy. And immediately she speaks to me in perfect English. And I was like, oh my God. And then I found out she grew up in Ohio. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, what? Yeah. Like, and I was like, oh my God. And so that was like really grounding and nice. And then the third wrestler, uh, Arisa Endo, uh, I, I got to speak to her and she did not speak any English at all, but it was adorable because when she, yeah, she, she even mis- misspelled my name on the autograph <laughs> thing, but I'm like, yeah, that's special. Wait, what did she, she, she spell it? Was it an RL thing? <laughs> no, she she did FL. Oh, okay. A and K. I yeah. tried to pull it out. Oh, yeah. dude. Yeah, yeah. We're, you're flank but, from flank. now on, though. No, flank, <laughs> flank. So, so yeah. But again, like it's it was just really cool and and uh, yeah. Again, I'm, I'm I'm already thinking like I don't think I will, but maybe. But like there is there New Japan Pro Wrestling is doing a show in Chicago next month, and it's like I just I just I don't know, I want to go. It's it's so exhilarating to like fly out, and I'm eager to hear from Jesse going out to Pax East, like. Again, it's, like, it's no like Japan. traveling. It, it's no, Boston. but it's like a mini Japan. The, uh, sure. No, it, it's um, <laughs> there's a lot of seafood, yeah, it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, true. yeah. No, I don't know. It, but it's like it, it's again like, after feeling so depressed and dour and so messed up from like, like not alone just winter depression, but like dad's passing and all yes. that and all the heavy crap I had to deal with. I'm happy I filled my brain with so many happy memories. And I think that was the point yeah. where it's like just in this last three weeks, I did so much more than I would ever do in like a single year of my life by just ex- like breaking the routine and going out, going to another country. I haven't traveled. Well, I traveled internationally to Canada, but it's still North America. So I haven't traveled like broad internationally since I was a kid going to Russia when I was like eight years old. So it was like just just that was such a launch. And, and thankfully, getting around Tokyo was extremely easy. Like the, the, I use the eSIM card, the internet, not surprisingly, like the cell service, the fastest I'd ever, it was insane. Uh, so, um, I felt confident. I felt comfortable. I felt extremely safe, extremely safe. I had no, no like issues or anything like that. Like I was surprised how like, it sounds like the closest you saw of a gun was the one at the crane machine. So yeah, I understand (laughs) the safety. There's airsoft things. Yeah. No, I felt again, I'm such a huge mark. Like here's this guy wearing anime pins and stuff and being such a dorky otaku, but at the same time, like whatever, I'm a tourist. I don't care. Um, so I felt I'm happy. I had no issues. So that that made me really good. So I'm excited to travel out again. And yeah, I think again, I'm happy to talk infinitely. I'm sure I will, but I'm happy. I also have a lot of context because now like, 
it's like I want to keep playing JRPGs. I want to keep playing Yakuza, like <laughs> so I can come back and be like, yeah, the, uh, like I want to play Yakuza three. So that if I ever go to Okinawa, it's like, yeah, this is like Yakuza three. <laughs> this takes me um, back. So. I know these streets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's I felt confident around the yeah around <laughs> Shinjuku. Around. Be like, yeah, <laughs> it's I know. Like, like you, you joke a little bit. I know you're like semi serious, but like I when I was a kid, I remember playing like the Tony Hawk games and then traveling for the first time around the United States and like seeing parts of like San Francisco and the Pacific Northwest and stuff that I had played the tony hawk version of and it was like i don't know why it like planted a seed of curiosity for travel in my head playing games as a kid because it was just like i don't know like when you're a kid you're kind of just like i bet everywhere is like kind of like this but just has like weird little differences and then you see those things modeled in video games and it, it like yeah i guess it just like plants a seed of curiosity so yeah i don't know like you're it's it's very like gratifying secondhand to see you get to like follow up on your passion for a lot of japanese culture and video games and stuff and kind of get to like yeah, I don't know. Like you said, it's like it fills you up. You know what I mean? Like it's not just the trip and then you're like, oh, that was a nice couple weeks. It like it gives you like a, something to like live for. It, it, yeah. it like fuels that passion. And then like, dude, I went to fucking Japan like seven years ago and I just started learning Japanese like less than a year ago. It like, I don't know, the, like the, those big trips stick with you and like alter your course as a human being. For sure, yeah. Like even even going to the toilets was like this is just like them, you know <laughs> it's just really just like perfect it was, days. It's just like uh, perfect days, but no, it, yeah, it's it's it, it's so funny because yeah, I didn't I didn't do Duolingo or anything like that. I just went in blind yeah. and like I don't know. Also, the last nugget, I could not believe it. Like also, we were there day two. That's when uh, Akira Toriyama passed away. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, yes. The Dragon Ball dude. So people, there were news crews going to Akihabara to like film stuff and interview. My friend got interviewed by some Japanese news crew, being like, "Do you know who this person is?" Like, and, and so that was like weird and also sad because like yeah, every shop had dedicated floors for Dragon Ball stuff, yeah. but. There was a Lawson's, a convenience store that was completely decorated with Dragon Quest like art on the walls. Like they had the slimes everywhere and characters. You could buy slime umbrellas and stuff. It was just like, this is everywhere. Now I need to play more Dragon Quest. Yeah. I've only played Dragon Quest 8, but I'm like, okay, this is the number one thing I'm missing from my my uh my my academics whatever yeah. <laughs> my your jrpg academia yeah. your understanding of the genre no yes the yeah. passing of akira toriyama very sad uh i mean you know it's he he's touched so much of media that i'm not surprised to hear that there was a big deal in japan i mean mm -hmm. it sounds like from the whole world was pretty devastated uh even my mom which i thought was funny really i was like hey you know what dragon ball is she's like yeah i'm like akira toriyama died she's like oh, what and i'm like how do you know who that is how do you know? Who that wow, is? Uh, that's you, crazy. What, are you a secret Goku fan? You big fan of? <laughs> she loves Sandland. That's what it is. So she's a big um, Sandland fan. So Frank, when are you moving to Japan? And uh, <laughs> so how much money do we take, need to get? I got. You? I got to take care of my mom. But <laughs> who knows? Decades from now, I I could teach English. I could move. I could. I don't know. If I I was also even legitimately brainstorming on my bike ride like yesterday or whatever. Rossi Oka, 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 Okagawa, I should learn the name. Rossi, the guy who used to run Stardom, is making his own promotion. If he needs to, I'm ready. If he needs to hire someone who can't speak Japanese at all, <laughs> who can work a camera or whatever. Penetrate the Western Rossi. markets. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I was yeah, just, how, do, how do I become a wrestling influencer? I just, I don't care. But that's the thing. It's way cheaper just to save up and like travel it once a year or whatever yeah. and then instead of moving. So I'm, I'm cool with that. But. You know, if there's any opportunity, it is also very know. hard to get Japanese citizenship, which leads to yeah. kind of like insecurity about renewing visas and stuff like work visas. Um, I also mm. learned this very recently. Uh, and apologies if this is wrong information. I read this in a few different places, but I'm not an expert on like immigration law or anything. But I believe to become a Japanese citizen, you you can't they don't like accept dual citizenship. So like if I passed the test and they're like, yeah, you can be like a Japanese citizen because you like so you've passed the j language proficiency test at like this tier and you're like this skilled and you have a degree and whatever uh i would have to renounce my american citizenship easy no yeah. <laughs> frank, <laughs> well, frank i'm oh. in if you're in dude let's do I'm this in. I'm let's in. do it <laughs> i'm in that's why i'm not invested in the election it's like whatever i'm going to japan Who cares? I'm I'm going, yeah. Yeah. who's the prime I'm minister japan. in this 10 years so, when i speak it. fluent I'm japanese yeah. yeah yeah i'm going to japan <laughs> hell yeah frank we should fucking we should if you ever want to start learning japanese i would love to do like i need someone to like practice with that i'm not that good yeah. so like don't, i go. suck so don't be intimidated but i if you ever want to like learn japanese we should learn together yeah, yeah. Look forward to some uh, Japanese narrated documentaries by Frank and Jeremy coming soon <laughs> to the NoClip uh, YouTube channel. Thank you so much for sharing your stories, Frank. I seriously, like, I'm not joking. I've been waiting to hear you for 30 minutes, and I know you could do another 30 hours. Yeah, um, yeah. So I... Please continue to bring it up uh, as the weeks go yes, on. Yes, anytime yeah. it's relevant, like, do, please never yeah. feel like you can't dip into the Japan well, because like I, my heart feels second handful just from hearing you talk about it. For yes, 30 minutes. like I, I really mean that.
seriously, same, same. Um, but you know, I, this is probably a good as time as any to talk about PAX. Oh hell yes, yeah! Yes, I went yes. to PAX East. It was my first PAX ever. Oh, nice. It was my second oh, awesome. gaming convention as as press. They gave me a a media badge and everything. Thank you, people at PAX, and also uh, no clip for letting me work here and say that I work here. Um, so yeah, PAX East in uh, Boston, twenty twenty four. This was the twentieth uh, PAX. Uh, Although I think only like the 18th in person, there were those two or three years where um, COVID happened. So, but this was uh, back to form, a second year back in uh, the location, and I had a blast. Uh, like I said, I've never been to something this big before as media, so it was different being on the other end of it. Um, I've been to like Fan Expo, the Canadian discount version of this, uh, and it was fun. <laughs> it was like it's kind of like when you go into a Dollar General and you want to go to a Dollar Tree yeah. or something, right? Uh, this is for all my all my uh, <laughs> poor homies out there. Um, it's like where's all the stuff? Why isn't there? You know, so it's 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 a little different, but it's I don't know. Pax East was uh, it was an experience because when I planned to go, it was mostly because it lined up with uh, my fiance's vacation time. She took about two weeks off or about a week off um, in March. And we were like, oh, hey, I was like, what if I could uh, what if I could swing this into being a work thing? What if I, could, you know, what if I could? Because then it's free, right? Sort of like the tax man doesn't have to know. Please, uh, CRA, don't listen to this. Um, <laughs> so we, you know, we ended up doing that. So the flight was included with that. And, and she came along and she was in the, the hotel with me and we were hanging out and she went out for dinner while I was out interviewing people and playing games and hanging out with some people that live in the area. Um, but the actual event itself, PAX East, was... Um, Really cool and really weird. So I had a lot of fun while I was there. The setup for it this time around, I don't know if it was like this when you went, Frank, because you went last year, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For me, it was like 50% video games and like 50% tabletop. Was that around oh, what yeah, you were yeah. seeing? Yeah. Is that normally what it's like for PAX? Yeah, I always ignore the tabletop. I just yeah, me ignore too. that side. Bro. And I'm like, all right, this is No, yeah. Like... <laughs> It's because I think I don't know if they used to do it, but PAX used to do a convention called PAX Unplugged. And okay. I don't know if that's still around. So I think that's why they just really beef up the tabletop thing. Even PAX Seattle, yeah, they have different floors dedicated to different stuff. Um, and also, like, I also I feel like PAX leans way more on like the community type stuff. So, like, here's a la here's a room to do console free play, here's panels, and let it's less of that E3, like, here's these stations, here, you know, here's companies demoing yeah. their games, here's free stuff. It's way more like, we got some video game stuff, but here's community stuff, community stuff, community stuff. And that's why I like going with friends and stuff. But yeah, covering and trying to find like new games. It's like there's the alleys of indie games, which you can find some gems. And I may get to hear about that. But like, I also feel like I don't, I feel like PAX, maybe it's totally different in 2020, 20, sorry, 2024. But I also don't know if PAX recovered as, as well post COVID. Like, I feel like the numbers weren't there. Or I think also just complete new cycle, uh, a generation of people who are into PAX. Like, because I was yeah. going a decade ago. Um, so. I, don't know, I still like it, but yeah, I, I would love to hear how it is as a newcomer. My question I always ask, and I want to hear about the games, but like, was it like what was the attendance like? Was it crowded? Were you okay? Do you get? I get. Yeah, I was. I was anxious in Tokyo with people. Like, how, how? Like, how? What was the crowd size this year? Yeah, it was weird. Uh, this time around, so I went on every single day that I could go for at least a couple of hours, uh, mostly because it was different sets of things there. Sometimes there was a dev for a game I want to talk to. Sometimes there wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, but on Thursday it was, it was okay. On Friday it was like a little crazy. That's, I got, uh, Cassie a pass for Friday and she was like an hour in. She was like, I want to leave. I hate it here. <laughs> There's too many gamers and I don't think any of them yeah. showered. Um, that's, that's what she sounds like, by the way. Uh, <laughs> she's whispering so, so the gamers didn't hear her. Yeah. 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 They didn't have their headsets on. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> their turtle beaches. They took off their turtle beaches. Yeah. Yeah. They couldn't yeah, hear the, like, what did you say? Steps. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you say something about, you, you talking about Call of Duty, man? What are you talking about? Man? Um, and Saturday was the day, though. They had sold out Saturday's passes, like, uh, February 8th or something. It was nuts. So it was just full of people. It was like, shoulder to shoulder, you were, you know, you better get used to the, the smell of maybe Axe and possibly a shower. Uh, it was, it, man... Sunday was Sunday was more chill, but Sunday was also the day where you could feel like the devs and I mean, obviously, but also the devs and the rest of the journalists were like, OK, 
I've had enough. <laughs> no more games, no more gaming. So yeah, it was it was pretty packed. I, I found it was um, very isolated to specific booths as well. I mean, this is normally what happens at conventions, but here it was like more than normal. So when you go into the event this year, there were a couple of big standout booths. There was the Mountain Dew booth. Uh, now this, of course, is the most important one. It's gaming, baby. We're here for Mountain Dew. Um, huge line around the building. I have to explain <laughs> this this Mountain Dew booth that they had. Like I, like, I could not believe what we sat through. So my buddy, Connor, shout out to Connor. He's not listening to this, uh, unless he is, in which case, thank you. Um, so there's one line that you have to get in to play a pachinko game or like a plinko game, I guess. It's like the one out of uh, Prices Right. And if you get a certain thing, you get either a pass that lets you do this special other thing called the vault where you type in a code and then it maybe you want an xbox series s wait this is all mountain dew this is all this is all just okay. mountain dew I just needed to clarify uh, so i could mentally image this no i'm trying to bring you on a journey so you're yeah. right i need to i place feel like i'm along right i just needed to i just needed to make sure i was envisioning because this is that enhances it so much for me if this is it's all it's dew. it's too involved for a mountain dew booth honestly yeah. so yes this first line that was maybe eight minutes of waiting uh you do the pachinko game and then there was another line if you wanted to just spin a wheel it was the same thing um and then after you win one of the prizes you go in line again and then you get to do the vault and then you win a bottle of gatorade or an xbox series s or a third thing that i cannot remember that's such I a big watch prize sing- discrepancy it's like <laughs> oh you waited like right? two lines and you like do this you do that uh, it's like you might get a, a one dollar bottle of soda or like an xbox yeah or or the less good xbox uh yeah. like it was it was took 20 minutes for that uh anyway that was my experience at the Mountain Dew booth. Uh, but that was so one of the big ones was that also because it was right there. Uh, and then there was a huge Larian booth like oh, yeah. Baldur's Gate 3 was like the reason you went there. I never went in line for that. Um, I played the game. I know what's up. All right. I've seen. Oh, yeah. We're all we all love the big red lady. But they had like cosplayers. It was very set up too. like they had uh, like a castle set up where you would go in and like play the games. And they had like the outside was nice. It was lit really well. They had a merch booth with like thirty dollar T-shirts was really nice. They look good if you're big into uh, Divinity or you're just into Baldur's Gate or Larian's work at all. Um, it was really cool to be there. And I think there were some devs, but not, not not too many. But it was it was cool to see so many people excited about it, taking pictures with the cosplayers. There was one person dressed up as a. What are those tentacle people that? Oh, the mind flayers. The mind flayers. Yeah, there was one of those, and and a lot of people were whispering, "Can I have sex with that?" And I was like, "Guys, come on, we are at PAX. Don't say that." Guys, come on. Of Um, course you can. Clearly, you haven't played the game. Um, Yeah, it was it was Larian, Mountain Dew, uh, and there was a third thing that was just absolutely packed. Oh, uh, this game I'd never heard of before called Into the Chronosphere. It looked really cool. Um, I didn't, I didn't go online to play it or anything, but it looked fun. I was surprised outside of that. It was just a lot of people walking around. It was just a lot yeah. of walking around, stop for two seconds, look at a game, keep walking, uh, which I think is the way to do it. Honestly, like <laughs> the, the demos are fun. They're cool, but holy, some of them take too long. Um, speaking of demos, I think this is where I want to bring up some of the games that I enjoyed. Yeah. Um, because despite the fact that it was fun and community focused and there was a lot of funny things going on, uh, the games is why I was there. That's all. I, I need a screen, baby, or I'm not paying attention. Uh, oh, wait, there was one more thing. Uh, Sandland, speaking of Akira Toriyama. Yeah. Um, there's a Sandland demo now on Steam. I'm not oh, being cool. paid. Uh, and they brought one of the tanks from Sandland onto the a real tank into PAX East. And you could like go in it and play the demo. It felt very like 2008 E3, like go inside of a dead whale's carcass to play Dishonored 1. Um, <laughs> it, it felt like in that sort of vein. So that was cool to see. But the games that I really enjoyed. So there was like a handful of stuff that um, I played and I was like, this is awesome. Uh, this is a game called Pipistrello and the Cursed Yo-Yo. Uh, it's developed by the same team that did um, Dodgeball Academia. It was like this like underrated indie arcade sports game a lot of fun um and then there were three that like really stood out to me that i wanted to talk about because they were my faves for sure uh so there's one called lucid by uh the matt black studio it was a kickstarter project it's like a precision platformer the pr person that i talked to there also why are there so many pr people there and not devs i get it i get that it's cheaper but also come on come on um Come on. The PR person called it a Celestoid Vania, which made me very upset. Uh, but also I knew what he meant. Like, I get it. I get that this is what we're doing with genres now where we're just smashing words together and it's easier than trying to explain it. But also, oh, my God, what a word. What a series Celestoid. of letters. Right. It's like, what are we what are we doing anymore? Um, 
so it's like this. It, it's a precision platformer that does play like Celeste. So I understand the comparison, but it's also a Metroidvania. So you kind of are maneuvering um, between these rooms. It doesn't play quite like Celeste uh, in terms of like the rooms that you're in. Like it's not like an individual screen that you're trying to solve the platforming puzzle for. And then you move on to a different bespoke screen. It's like one long hallway connected by platforming challenges. So you can dash between gems in the same way that you would dash between strawberries it's done in a pixel art style so it's again very similar to that um but it's more about chaining long strings of executions and less about like shorter moments um like in celeste it's a lot of like okay do a quick little thing get a strawberry come back and then do a couple other small things in the same screen this is like you cannot advance until you've completed this execution challenge and once you have it's it feels really good and, it, and feeling really good is what I think they nailed there. It feels fantastic. Um, it, it won a game of the show from past the controller. If that means anything to anyone, uh, I met one of the people from there. It's very nice. <laughs> um, and yeah, overall I, I really enjoyed lucid. I thought that was really, really fun. I think that's one that I'm looking forward to the most. Cause it's, I like, I like going fast and it reminded me of like a 2d almost, um, neon white. So Oh, nice. You know, you know how much of a freak I am for that. Uh, the second one was Heartworm. And Jeremy, I know you were really excited about this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When uh, I'm, that's the only reason I know about it is because you were talking about it. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Dread XP picked it up. Uh, the publisher not too long ago. I spoke with uh, someone there and they were telling me that they had a hiring freeze and that like management went, you know, a little a little money, money blocky, which I understand. It's it's the year for that. Right. Uh, that's what I got from speaking to a lot of devs, actually. I mean, I know Danny's been talking about it and it's been sort of the talk of the space. But even people there who seem like, you know, this is an exi- this is something that they, they're, their lives on the line for this. You know, like they got to they got to see it succeed. And even they were like, man, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but whatever. Also, as, a, as an aside, uh, d- if you're looking up this game, do not just Google Heartworm. Do not just Google I, Heartworm. You know, I make this mistake every time <laughs> I look up this game. And I'm equally <laughs> disgusted every time. Just add game to the Google. Just do yourself a favor. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Steam. Anything. Yeah. Just uh, I, I'm gonna name. I'm gonna make a game someday. Just name it. Whatever the grossest image I can find on Google Images. I'm just gonna name it that. <laughs> just to fuck with people. Harlequin. Don't yeah. Google oh, Harlequin, baby. Don't do it. Um. It's not that scary. It's a little scary. It might be a jump scare. Um, so yeah, Heartworm is a 90s throwback survival horror game done in the style of like Resident Evil or Silent Hill. You play as a, a, a woman named Sam who falls into this internet uh, rabbit hole trying to investigate a house in the woods that has a room in it that allows you to speak to people who have died. And I I think this this might be... This might be scary in in deep ways uh, that that shook me to my core. So Heartworm starts off with you, again, approaching this house in the woods uh, after a short cutscene sort of setting up the story. And once you get in there, you're just doing Resident Evil Silent Hill puzzle solving, right? You go in and it's like, oh, I uh, move chess pieces and then the chess pieces open up a, a cabinet underneath the chessboard. It's like the only the kind of stuff that a, a mad genius or an escape room company would put together, right? Like it doesn't make it's never made any sense. The Resident Evil puzzles to me and Heartworm embraces that, which is cool. Uh, The controls feel very similar to the classic games. I mean, I just played a bunch of them in a row. So I remember the control scheme and how the tank controls are supposed to feel. What button is aim? What button is run? What button is your inventory? It's all exactly correct uh, as you would expect it. And then I think the way that it takes the uh, homage aspect of survival horror and really spun it on its head was was two things. So one the um the camera is fixed camera right so like it's it's stuck you know you fixed camera you've played one of those games before probably if you haven't it's it's like up in the corner and it's staring at you uh but what it does that i think most of the other games that use fixed cameras tend to not embrace enough is the artistry of it uh the camera angles and the way that they frame shots in heartworm is truly deeply like I, oh my god, like I was emotionally invested every time the camera cut because it was some new interesting shot. Sometimes you get like there's an ashtray with a cigarette that's uh, just lit out and you see the smoke coming off of it as your character's entering the door frame and there's like a sofa next to it and the light in the distance and it's like, wow, that's beautiful. And then you walk forward and like there's a shot that's set up so it's just the character standing in the door frame on the left of the frame and then like just blank wall and you're like, whoa, like it's it's very unnerving and, and beautiful and like there's just so much artistry and, and so many parts of Heartworm just right away from the demo. You can tell like 
this this has some chops behind it. But then it subverts the rules. And this was what I thought was really scary because I feel like Resident Evil Survival Horror Silent Hill. They're not scary. Like when you're playing them, they're not scary. The scary part of Silent Hill is how it gets into your bones and like makes you wonder if what you're doing is true or real. Um, And this game is doing something that I don't think I've seen a lot of the homage games approach, which is subverting the rules of survival horror games. It embraces them by like truly capturing the controls and capturing the visuals and the mechanics and like what you expect. But then it flips it on its head and goes, actually, sometimes we're not following those rules and you're not going to see it coming. Uh, one early one, I'll it's like two minutes into the demo. So if you, you know, whatever, go play it. But uh, it's, it's on Steam. It's free. When you walk up to this room, that is like the, the room that you're looking for uh, in the house. When you walk towards it, the camera starts zooming in. And I was like, no, you don't do that. What are we doing? What's happening? Because fixed camera, it's, it's fixed. It doesn't move. It's it's stuck in place. And then it's, and there's like a couple moments like that in Heartworms just demo where I was like, okay, they're going to, they're going to fuck me up. I'm not, I'm not ready for this. Uh, so I really, really like that. There was one quote I wanted to read um, from the game that, that did something to me. I got to, I got to log into my no clip account here to read the quote. Yeah, um, no, while you do that, I just wanted to say that I don't know if this, I'll have to download this and see if it's the same demo that I played a while ago. Um, but the demo that I played of this game, like, fucking blew me away. Uh, like, one of the things you mentioned was the cinematography, which I think was really powerful. Yes. But not only that, it's also like, uh, it it does things with fixed camera that you just can't do without fixed camera where like yeah. when you play it. Cause I love, you know, like Resident Evil four, like more contemporary horror games. I think they're good in their own way. Uh, but they, by forcing the player to look in a certain direction, heartworm sets up a lot of scares that are very uh, like subtle, I guess like there's, yeah. there's one in particular where there's this really, uh, there's a shot with a ton of depth, basically this like, fucking citizen cane, like seven layer shot. And, uh, just a figure like a shadowy figure just runs by but it's so far away uh like very noticeable but so far away and uh, the game kind of just like it's like the bits the bit from signs yeah it just, alien and it just it's just like behind, it's, it's behind. i feel like the most effective scares for me aren't when i mean there's like the classic like resident evil the dogs burst through the window and like that shit is yeah. great because it's so in your face but the, the stuff that really gets under my skin is when it's just like a little a little like hey what'd you think of that that's you're like oh that's way scarier because that's like just fucked yeah. up like tell me what that that is and where it is i don't want to know that that's in the house and i like don't know where it is now yeah it's like in alan wake 2 uh there's a there's a scare that happens that's totally not intentional because that game does a lot of like the jump scary like hey whoa wouldn't it be crazy if we flashed a, Here's a face. random clip whoa oh my god old lady um but the truly scariest part of that whole game is is when ati appears behind you <laughs> Like for no reason, yeah, he yeah. just starts talking to you. I'm like, wait, how'd you get here? It was this. That's the scariest moment of the game because it's like you. It's not the stuff they're trying to scare you with. It's when the systems feel like they've been cheated. When you when yeah. you're like, wait, whoa, 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 hold on. We we had an agreement here. 15 hours in. Um. So I love that stuff. Uh. The, the quote from Heartworm though that that really stuck out to me that made me go, okay, all right, day one. Um. So it's a note that you find in the house, presumably from somebody who who was also there on the same mission as you. If this is real, if this place is what they say it is, I don't even know how I'll feel. Will it answer the questions that I and everyone who has ever lost someone has spent so long asking? And what if it does? Will that change anything? And like, yeah, that fucking rules. The only other game that's made me feel that sense of like, because, you know, I, I lost my dad when I was young, so I don't know like a whole lot about him. I'm always kind of chasing that part of it um, and like you know, trying to learn more. But when you learn that more, it's like, how true is any of it, right? Is it's all their experience told through someone else's lens. So like when you find this stuff, how true is any of it, right? When you go through the process of, of discovery, um, what does that mean? The only other game that's ever done that for me was, um, what remains of Edith Finch. And that is one of my favorite games of all time. Also, Ben Esposito worked on that game, so he's got a great track record. Um, but yes, I, that, ah, it's, it's been sitting with me for days since I played it. So I had to get that one, uh, out of my system. So heartworm, Love it. Very cool. The last one from from PAX, and this is just for me. I'll be very quick on this one, um, is Starvaders. I went there every every day I went to this booth. It Oh, my God. Ah, in a year where we're, we're playing casino games with Bellatro and sitting there and playing <laughs> poker for hours, this this game is going to make me stop playing Bellatro. I, I, oh, I love it. So it, it plays like Starvaders is a, a deck building roguelike. Womp, womp. Uh, but it's also <laughs> a tactical strategy game. I know. I know that. How many times have you heard that one? Um, 
but weirdly, I feel like a lot of games that try to do that, try to do the Slay the Spire, like deck building, card based combat stuff and tactical uh, gameplay have a tough time making that work. Either the tactical stuff is too complex that it makes doing the card game stuff not fun, or the card game stuff is so much fun that you'd rather not be doing the tactical stuff. Uh, the only game I feel like that's ever married that properly is Marvel's Midnight Suns, because the tactics are really just about positioning and not much else. Uh, and then your cards are just sick as hell. So it, you don't mind spending five seconds positioning Iron Man to do a big, I don't know, rocket blast or something. This one is much simpler. It's an indie game from a studio that I think is only, this is their only game because they're called Star Vader's Studio. So <laughs> you wouldn't really call yourself that and work on a Mario game. Um, so there, so it, it plays like Slay the Spire where you draw a set of cards and they all have different abilities. And then the tactics are like, you you control a mech that shoots bombs and, and bullets and like the enemies come towards you like it's sort of like Space Invaders. So they're coming down and you got to stop them before they reach the bottom or you lose health. Uh, there's a limited number of cards you can play each turn. And then there's modifiers for the cards that like change their interactions and stuff. There's just a lot of cool synergies. I had a ton of fun playing it again. I went every single day. If you're a freak for these games, there's a demo on Steam. You'll know right away whether or not you're into it. Um, yeah, that that's all I've got on Star Vaders. It's no, I, the only other thing is I brought Cass to play it. She played one minute and stopped playing and the dev went, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Did you not like the demo? And she was like, I liked it so much. I had to stop playing. I would have been here all day. <laughs> like, so that's is, that's got to be a good sign. I have to ask. This is like the dumbest guy question to ask about it. It's such an interesting video game. But what is it? What is it? What's is it? Oh, is Vader's like invaders? I've been trying to parse Vader's as a. As yeah. A so oh, yeah. their their inspiration for the enemies moving is space invaders. Okay, okay, okay. So it's like star Vader's. It's like like Darth Vader. I don't know what they're called. I was thinking that uh, that's I was stuck on Darth Vader and I was like, is I didn't want to like Google it while you were talking and be rude. But I was like, is Darth Vader, is Vader like a thing? I just didn't connect with invaders. I'm just dumb. No, oh, yeah. It's it's uh it's it also has the the SEO problem of the Steam name having a star in the middle of it like oh, an yeah. ASCII star. I if you're listening to this, folks, don't get get that out of there. Get that you're hurting yourselves. Um, now I had one question about PAX related stuff because Frank, you've been Jeremy, you've been. I assume. Yeah. You were in Boston. You didn't have a choice. Um, they forced you to go if you're a resident of Boston. They, it's it's part of the uh, citizenship test, actually. Uh, me and my you, 600 friends named Sully all had to go. Uh, yeah, you and John Cena were going every weekend. <laughs> John um, Cena used for, to go arm in arm together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was crushing yours. Uh, um, yeah, my arm was ruined forever because of it. I had the hardest time standing there watching people play demos. I have so much oh, more yeah. respect for game developers because I didn't even work on these things. I have no financial interest in them succeeding. Watching people not read the text on the screen, I was like this close to strangling people because I was like, just read the tutorial. How did you, did you guys experience that too while you were at any of these conventions or GDC? So that So that's why like Thursday, that's why you try to go Thursday. You sprint, like what I do is I sp- kind of like do a speed walk. I zip through the convention before I try anything. Like I want to try this game, this game, this game. And then I'll do multiple laps. And when I see the station open, I'll play it. I cannot wait. I have zero page or like I'll wait a little bit to see if I like the game and then I'm good. But yeah, I don't want to like have the experience. Because yeah, a lot of times it's like it's like when I used to watch like old episodes of Nick Arcade and like people wouldn't know like to go right in a Sonic video game. And you're like, oh, oh, oh. it's like, yeah, like it's it's like I can't it's like it's it's I don't know. But also it's that can be funny, too, by the end of the convention when you're loopy. But like, no, I I, I hate lines. I hate waiting. But yeah. sometimes when I'm watching a game, instead of playing it, I'll talk to the developer. Be like, OK, I see that. And then I'm like, I don't need to play it. I can just see it like so. So sometimes it's easier just to talk to the people working on it. But then they're also really fun because they're also like trying to eye the person playing the demo and like. Their, their attention's very split, and it's always this kind of fun day. Like, hold on one second. Like, because uh, developers will do it, too. Yeah. Developers will run and be like, wait, okay, so you, you press X every, like, they'll have that urge break and be like, let me help this person get through. Also, because people have to keep the line moving. So, like, it's best when demos have timers. Yeah. Um, uh, but, yeah, it's, uh, I adore, again, I adore the convention culture stuff. But I I, I was eager to answer, but, yeah, J- Jeremy, I wanted to hear your, your, your take. Yeah, no, I was lucky enough to, I, I didn't go to a lot of, like, cons at all before I worked in Games Press, so. So I've been lucky enough to like most of my experience playing games with developers at conferences has been at E3 and I've had appointments and stuff like working for GameSpot and stuff. Uh, 
So I've been fortunate in that respect. But yeah, no, there has been a lot of times where I've just waited in line and then like the only thing to do is kind of just like people watch and look around and then you yeah. just have to watch as like someone's like yeah i think i like broke the game and then the dev goes up and they're like i've i've this has never happened before and they're like <laughs> it's in like a new resolution that this person invent like it's just i feel so fucking bad if i ever show a game at a con i feel like it, i will need to like either hire someone else to do it or just have like an iv of xanax going into my body to handle the stress yeah, I guess that was why there were so many PR people. Now that I think about it, because like the devs are the money, but also the devs are probably like, I I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could stand Dude, there and watch people judge my work like that. It's also not like knowing I made it. You work on games in like such a vacuum, especially as like a small indie developer or like a solo developer. You're like working on this thing, pouring your soul into it in your like little fucking room in your house, and then you bring it out into the the big bad world. And there's people who are like. I'm not I'm not saying people are disrespectful. People are typically very respectful at conventions and they like show reverence for games and they're there because yeah. they love games and media and they see them as an art form. But there is a way in which you're like, I like when I try to when I play a devs demo and they're right there, I try to just be very communicative that I'm like, this is really cool. This is really interesting. And sometimes people are like, what's this? What's this? And they're like, oh, my God, I just want this person to like understand my vision. And it's like I see like the panic on their face as they're like, is, do they hate it? I don't know if like and then they have to go through that a thousand <laughs> times. It's like it just seems so stressful yeah i i can't even imagine trying like I, you know I, you get comments on a youtube video and it's like i want to die and i can't imagine <laughs> totally. getting those comments in real life totally. so more power to the devs that put themselves out there like that uh two more things about pax super quick one there was a mega 64 booth um i had never met rocco before i didn't introduce myself but i was like holy shit that's rocco and then there was a little screen and i was like hey wait a second oh yeah there's yeah. my good friend frank howley on the screen oh, nice. i got a video of you as i think uh team gohan or yeah one, one yeah, of the yeah yeah um that was cool i was like oh my god it's like he's here it's like i'm in japan um <laughs> yeah and the other thing and Frank, again, you went to PAX as media for 2023, right? They gave you a pass or, or did you pay for your pass? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because no, I, mean, yeah. I, I want to save 250 yeah. bucks. <laughs> yeah. But so you went with a media pass. Um, you talked to a couple developers for your video, but like, did you ever run a new scenario where after you had played the demo, you they were like, so what did you think? And you introduced yourself and they went, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's so funny. Like, I feel like a lot of times de devs are very eager to like talk to you, especially yeah. at once once they know like like. So that's why like I feel like I don't talk to developer unless I'm like all the way interested in a game. Like, yeah. I'll, I'll kind of scan something. Like, okay, no, I'm in, I'm in. Um, because I also like don't want to break people's hearts. Like, I don't want to hear your pitch. Like, I'm not trying to be rude, but it's like I want to see other stuff. Like, yeah. are there are 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 there? I see a Chainsaw Man cosplay. No, um, <laughs> um, um, no. So, but it's cool. Yeah, it's. It, but like, I always try to go things objectively. Like. I just want to see the whole because it's the same thing like when we were I worked at Mega sixty four like I've been going to PAX quote unquote professionally for like a decade I think the last time I paid for a badge was like twenty fifteen twenty four like for like which like so going to cons like you can also come be friends with everyone so it was so like I don't know it's 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 always fun to go to it but yeah like I always like talking in person after and being like oh yeah I love talking about the game and then mention it like like uh, I think you saw them Anton Blast was there yeah and, like, I talked to them and interviewed them before I even said I worked at NoClip or whatever and then I made that video like wait what the hell like and so I think Tony Grayson's his name again. Anton Blast wishlisted at games in like yeah, it's I, so cool. Very it, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, but it is very flattering. Like you said, like people express wishes for Danny, like get better. Like, yes, yeah, so really I was nice just gonna say, say that. Like, yeah. Oh, when when people recognize NoClip and say thank you because it's like, I feel like especially like you, both you guys like like uh, uh, Jesse and Jeremy are such heroes for like digging for the indie games because like that's the big that's the number one thing PAX is for is indie games I think like because a lot of AAA studios aren't 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 spending time or resources out there like PAX West is a little bit more because it's close to that holiday window and they want to get it PAX East it's like a lot of times I feel like gets ignored um so the indie games so developers are really shooting their shot trying to get recognized so like it also it would make my day too like I, I, I appreciate Jesse also tweeting it out like this game looks cool this game looks cool it's like yeah getting any kind of exposure in this world where like there's so much stuff. Also, influencers like being mad if they don't get review copies or don't get like six hundred dollars a video or whatever the hell you know. Like, it's just like man, for someone to genuinely care about a game and talk about it. Like again, J Jesse talked about Bellatro, and now it's like millions of copies. Also, uh, that game melted my uh, Steam deck? plane ride. No, my plane oh, I ride. Oh. I played Bellatro the whole time. So, so no, it's really cool when, when developers recognize NoClip, and then same thing like when we talk about a game on the podcast and post about it. Like, I don't know. Again, I think we're all 
passionate about video games. They're all eager to play it and just getting the word out means a lot. So yeah, the fact that people, again, like as I'm sitting here, I'm talking to like my friends catching up. It's like, oh, there's people listening to, oh, yeah. oh, hi. Oh, there's other yeah, people I in the room? Do. What? Oh, I know. I feel the same way when we myself back into it. Yeah. I, uh, that, yeah. My, <laughs> like, I, my hope is that like that's what people, I, cause like the pod, I don't listen to many podcasts, but the few podcasts that I've listened to throughout the years, the thing I enjoy about it is when like the people on there are just genuinely enjoying each other's, you know, conversation and company and stuff. So like, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's fun just to like reflect on this shit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that was PAX. I, I had fun. I met a lot of cool people. Uh, I didn't go in the Sandland tank, so I don't know. Like Damn, five dude. out of ten. That's my review. You should review. have stolen the Sandland tank. You think it drives? I should have. You know what? I feel like if I rode that around uh, Boston, it would have survived the absolutely horrendous weather. It was freezing. It oh, was yeah. so windy and cold. I hated it. Also, why is there yeah. nowhere to eat? In Boston, what's going on there? You know, there's no oh, food there's not a great district. selection. I've, I've, whenever people ask me for Boston recommendations because I grew up there, I feel bad because I'm like, I, there's like <laughs> <Nothing>. the touristy <laughs> spots and like, you know, Union Oyster House and whatever the fuck. And like, yeah, I'm just like, just take what you could get. Like, don't pay $35 yeah. for a lobster roll. Dun- Dunkin' yeah. Donuts is not as good as people say. Uh, it's better than Tim Hortons, though. Sorry. Whoa, hold on. <laughs> I knew that was going to be a fucking. Hold on a oh, second. Tim Hortons First off, awesome. Tim Hortons Tim, sucks. No, Tim Hort- Here's the thing. Tim Hortons is ass. It's bad now. It used to be better. Yeah. Uh, no, the pandemic screwed it oh, up. Really? I yes. think like, 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 cause where I, where I would visit was like just outside Quebec. Like my friend, she had a Tim Hortons like down the street. So every morning we go to Tim Hortons and like 2019, this was the best place ever. When I went in 2021, it was like all new kids working there and it sucked. And like, now this is me being like a Karen being like, they got my order wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or they're being anti-American, which I don't blame yeah. them. But like, uh, um, I don't know. Uh, also now I, there's a famous video of a woman shitting in a Tim Hortons. Yeah, baby. Dude, <laughs> Tim Hortons incredible. is where the messed up stuff happens. You, you love to see I, uh, it. Uh, yeah. In the defense of Tim Hortons, I would bet $10,000 right now that that has <laughs> happened in a Dunkin' Donuts. Whether no, or not it's on film, just no footage of it. who knows? Yeah. That if it is, it probably that film probably belongs to Dunkin' Donuts and it is like in a vault somewhere. But it has happened. Now, I'm with you on the Tim's hatred, to be clear. I think it's second, sec- cup. second cup we rep. <laughs> I wish there were more of them in the city. But- Dunk sucks. Munchkins yeah, is bad. Oh, Munchkins, munchkins are, is a bad. Munchkins no, is a bad. Are name. you a Munchkins hater? That's the one saving hater. grace of dunks, dude. Because you know, because you know what? No, 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 no. Tim bits. They help is, Dorothy. Yeah, is funny exactly. as hell. <laughs> I want. They did. It's true. There's a whole guild of them. Um. The but Tim bits. I want some Tim's yeah. bits in a box, dude. Dude, what's fucking? What's the difference between Tim bits and uh? And Nothing. It's the same. It's just a donut hole. Oh, it's the same. Thing. Justin Bieber has a has yeah. a flavor of All Tim right, bits. Dude. Well, you That's can, right. You can go He's got his own iced coffee. Have your Tim bits. What does yeah, Duncan have? Uh, who's the, who's the Al guy? Pacino? Al Pacino. Yeah. Ooh, actually, I ben, take it back. Ben, oh no, Ben Affleck yes. in every single like. That's true. He's always photo. juggling like a hundred coffees. Yeah. yeah. The man yeah. is addicted to caffeine. As Ice Spice into that's right. I Spice it a commercial. Okay. Yeah. So actually, Duncan does win. Dude, I stick with it. America runs on Duncans. All right, that's their it's, slogan. You know what I mean? <laughs> but not the West Coast. Yeah, that's true. I, okay. What does well, the West Coast the, run on? Not the coastal elites. <laughs> I don't know what the yeah. coastal. Yeah. Yeah. Real <laughs> Americans love Dunkin' Donuts. You know what I mean? Not you. I yeah, the working <laughs> you, class. Yeah, the working it. class. Yeah. Me and my buddy Sully went down. Dude, my defense <laughs> of Dunkin' Donuts is that if you're incredibly hungover and you're 19 and you live in Boston and you, and you stumble <laughs> down to the Dunkin' Donuts, then that is when it transforms. It, it reveals itself to you. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like like if I go in a church, I'm like, this is just like a, a white building. But if you're like mega religious and you go in there, you're like. No, this is like God's house. And I think when you're hungover in 19 and from Boston, that's when Dunkin' Donuts reveals its true nature to you. So that's when it becomes the chapel that we're all looking for. The si- yeah. You're looking up at the Sistine Chapel when you walk into Dunkin' Donuts and it's just a bunch of like discarded gum thrown at the ceiling. You're like, wow. <laughs> it's a bunch of shitty, they really, like, they graffiti. changed it. Someone like carved yeah. a swastika <laughs> under the table and you're like, the humanity was truly no, contains dude, You're getting in an argument with your friend. You're like, it's no, it's backwards, dude. It's not a swastika. It's, it's a, a Hindu. One. There's a lot of, there's it's, a big Hindu population in Boston, dude. Yeah, actually. Man, it's, it's different, bro. You're just but, like a pasta guy who's desperate to defend his city. He's like, no, we're not racist, dude. There's like a ton of Hindus here. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Well, Jeremy, um, it's time to talk about a video game that you, it doesn't seem like, liked very much. I Hopefully, ha- Frank okay. did a little bit. It seems yeah. like you hate it. Uh, you no. want it. You want it to go away forever. No, uh, no. Nobody should buy it, is what you're saying. Dragon's Dogma 2. Let's hear about it. He's setting me up for this is a trap. Um, yep. No, Dragon's Dogma 2. I just, I I honestly, I, what I'm more interested in hearing is Frank's take on Dragon's Dogma 2 because uh, <laughs> let me give you a little pre- preface here for why I'm so interested. A, I have not played the first one, so I have zero context. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. 
Uh, B, I it, on paper, it's such a fucking me game. It's like a like a weird kind of like arcane esoteric but also like very tropey fantasy RPG that just like lets you fuck up and makes you walk really long distances. And like, I I made like a cat man as my companion and his name is beans. Uh, and <laughs> I was like on paper, this is like a, a fucking me game, but I'm just like, I don't know. I'm just not, I'm having trouble connecting with it. So I am more interested in, for, instead of me being like nitpicking the first three hours of dragon's dogma two, I want you to convince me that this game rocks. Cause I want to like it. Uh, so an interesting thing of like I loved the first Dragon's Dogma and okay. I can't recall if they played the like they put out like a game of the year edition called like Dark Arisen like a, a an enhanced version I think I played the vanilla dark dark uh, D D Dragon's Dogma but I could be wrong but I played it like a decade ago I game played it I really like that game it's very action RPG way friendlier than a Souls game if you die in Dragon's Dogma you can just reload your save you only have one save but you can reload it you don't have to worry about lost souls or whatever you can revive yourself with Wake Stone if you need to like so it's friendlier than Dark Souls that said it's not all the way easy like a Bethesda game it's like it's it's like it's also like monster, like Monster Hunter, which like you got to be precise with your movements. You got to kind of practice your loadouts uh, going into it. But the thing that makes the game exceptionally easy is the pawn system. Mm. So like it's when I play it, it feels like I'm playing Final Fantasy 14, except I'm not worried about grinding dailies or like talking to other people. It's like There's like no I moogles. have a, a four, no, I yeah, you. I always have three pawns in my party, and I'm playing it as an archer because like going into it, I played the first Dragon's Dogma as a basic fighter, like sword and sword and shield, and it's cool because you can like. Climb on Cyclops, stab him. I've already done that. I do the same thing in Monster Hunter. I want to try an archer. I've never played an archer in a Capcom, like in a dark, in these games. So to me, it's like, feels like I'm still playing Resident Evil, like a third person shooter. I'm just going up and blasting goblins with arrows from afar while these pawns rush up and do spells and set them on fire and I'm sniping them. And like, this is so goddamn cool. Um, so, so I find it really fun. The thing I really like about it is even getting the game. Like I came back from Japan. I still found Fantasy VII. There's so many games I'm going to love. The conversation on this game already pissed me off because it was like it launched like mixed or negative Steam reviews. Everyone was angry about microtransactions. Yeah. As a Capcom fan, we've been waiting for this game for like 10 years. I don't just let me play it. Shut up. Everyone shut up. Let me play the game. I don't care. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Let me play the game. Let me play the game. Like yes, the dude. fact that this exists is a miracle. Because it's like a it is like a like a pristine B game. It's I always Dragon's Dogma's in the category, like this is silly and stupid. I love it. It's that. It's like so. What I find really enjoyable about it is it's reminding me of playing like Red Dead Redemption where I'm like hiking in the mountains. Oh, if it mm. goes night, I sleep. I'm going to camp. I don't want to. And when you cook food, it shows a live action effort, like a like a live action <laughs> video of steak <laughs> yeah. grilling. Like it's charming and silly and endearingly. I don't want to say stupid, because that's, but like, it really is like there's just stuff in the game that's just so silly. Like, yeah, 10 foot tall cat people that you can hire to join your party. And then you send you send your other pawn off and you give them a, a piece of rotten meat as a thank you present to the poor person who let me rent their pawn. Um, um, it's it's just, I don't know, it feels like playing a solo, this sounds so dumb, it's like playing a single player Final Fantasy XIV. I know Final Fantasy VII exists, but it's kind of, ca I don't know, to me it's like a casual, so like, I know it's not literally a Souls like, but it's like a casual action RPG that's a little bit tough. But it's like if you've endured Monster Hunter, I feel like it's like I don't know. I, I feel I feel like it's way more fun to play the Monster Hunter because Monster Hunter is brutal and you're, you're kind of limited. This I, mean, I don't even care what the main story is. You're Dark Risen. You got like demon blood, but you're nice. Whatever. It's like Claymore. Whatever. Um, I don't care. You walk into town and the kid's like, Miss, Mrs., can you find me a piece of silver? Oh boy. Or, oh no, our friend Milton's gone looking for treasure and goblins kidnapped him. Can you go rescue him? Milton. It's like, sure, I don't care. It's it's really just like, and like NPCs are like, oh, can I have a hundred gold to buy this? Oh, thank you. I'll pay you in four days. It's it's just like, I don't know. It feels like playing Baldur's Gate 3, but I'm not afraid to play it. Baldur's Gate 3, I'm so, I overanalyze every choice. Yeah. The tactical battles can take an hour. I die. I re want to reload. Dragon's Dogma, it's like, I'm kind of playing it carefree. And it's really fun. And like, I can't remember the first, I feel like the first two hours, I think I was miserable. Okay. With it. I was <laughs> That's like, good. That's actually like, <laughs> very reassuring yeah. because I kind of just like, I, I, I keep waiting for a moment where I'm like, oh, like this is the thing that everyone loves about this. I feel like I just need to like relax and just power through like five yeah. hours of it and just kind of sink into the atmosphere a little bit. I keep waiting because I don't know what the like, it's like I'm at a restaurant and I was like, yeah. Do you, oh, are we getting like Italian? Are we getting Chinese? And my friend were like, you just wait and see. Well, you'll wait till we get there. And I'm like oh, eating yeah. the food and I'm like, I don't know what country this food is. I don't know what the theme of this place is. Yeah, to, to me, the fun is, is like, I'll pick a quest on my map. Like the crazy, the, the like, the the story I found today that was really sweet is I wanted to play like an hour or two before we recorded today. Like, so I loaded up my save and I think I, 
I was already going to go do a quest that's like, go down all the way to this mine and clear it of goblins. Okay, I'll check that. That's so far. I'm going to walk because, like, it's fun to walk in this game because you'll run into, like, like Red Dead. There's strangers who want to offer you quests. Pawns who want to join your party. Another group of people who will, like, size you up and either attack you or let you go. Like, there's just always enemies around that will mess you up. But then but as I was leaving the This isn't, like, a town, multiplayer thing, though, the people that are no, running into you, No, it's single player. So it's, like, it's, no, okay. yeah, so it's just, like, other other people. And it's, like, that same identity, four players, four people, not human player, or, sorry, not, like, other gamers. It's just, like, okay. AI NPCs. But it's like, it's, it's, like, oh, wait, that's just another group of adventurers. Oh, Okay, I respect. But like, if you get closer, like, watch it. Like, it's also I still like play a game in. J- I'm playing all my games in Japanese oh, yeah, now. It's awesome. so fun. Just it's like I'm still in Japan. Um, so like I was I was gonna go all the way to this mine. As soon as I get to like the entrance of this, I'm leaving this town. There's a quest that's like, oh, sir, can you deliver this letter uh, to to this you know to this person all the way in this camp far away? Hey, it's better if you take an ox cart. Our 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 carts keep getting raided in the middle of the night. Can you take our my cart? be a passenger in case you get in you know in case anything happens and then deliver the letter so i said yes i get in the ox cart i doze off the cart starts going it's like a fast travel and then you wake it's in the middle of the night and your uh, your cart's being attacked by like goblins and creatures so me and my party get out and we start i start blasting arrows and then i don't know what happened i think inadvertently friendly fire i attack other passengers on our cart so everyone turns against my party so now we're killing like goblins and also other <laughs> soldiers and i accidentally oh kill God. like story npcs and it's like i can revive henry for a wake stone but i'm not wasting a wake stone so i leave this body just dead and stranded so then i'm running now the ox cart's gone i don't know what the fuck this quest is it's oh i'm over it i got to i got to deliver this letter i'm over the ox cart you're you're screwed i accidentally <laughs> killed the dr- the driver and so I'm running and it's nighttime and I'm just and like skeletons are spawning. It's like Zelda at night when there's like there's skeletons just rising up trying to attack me. So then it feels like Resident Evil 4 shooting stuff with my archers, whatever. And then there's like a mini Cyclops, whatever. I finally find a campsite so I can rest and switch it to daylight. And then it's way easier. I'm not stressed. I when you eat, you get health boosts and stuff like that. So then all right, I'm going to keep going to this village. And then along the way, of the village, I see like a treasure chest on top of a mountain. Well, how the hell do I get to that treasure chest? So I ignore whatever the main quest is. I start hiking up this like waterfall, find a way to cross the waterfall so I can go back down the other side of the river, get this chest. But at the top of the mountain, on top of this waterfall is like the waterfall cave. And I go into this cave and then I start fighting like green slimes and lizard people and poisonous lizard people and see a massive boss that I don't want to fight yet. So I'm going to find another way out of the cave. And then I completely forget the original chest. And then I end up finally like i'm like now it's like red dale i'm hiking i feel boosted i've seen grass not in real life but on the tv uh and then i finally make my way to like the camp deliver the letter and then i pick up another quest and it's like i just keep playing and it's like oh i'm not concerned about like the trophies the achievements or whatever i'm just genuinely like it's like playing it's like being hooked on world of warcraft and i don't want to log yeah. off i'm and, but also like i'm not listening to podcasts or music i'm just like genuinely enjoying it and the sounds of it and the animation like again i get the criticism it's like 30 frames per second on ps5 it, it doesn't look great but it, it's exactly how dragon zogma was on 360 which back then blew me away and i was hooked on so it's like i know i'm happy to keep reporting on this if i keep sticking with it but it's like man this is kind of cool final fantasy 7 is cool but like it's there's open world spots you're doing a bunch of side quests and then story stuff open world and then story stuff dragon's dogma is just I'm just going a direction fighting goblins and skeletons, and this is cool. Like it, the way you're and, describing uh, so, yeah. Dragon's Dogma Two sounds very similar to uh, the Fat Session on Morrowind, or how it I felt was just playing Oblivion say, for the first time. I feel time. like I I need to treat Dragon's Dogma Two like I'm playing an MMO that nobody else is in because that's yes, that's yes. the feeling that I've gotten when I played Morrowind, when I played New Vegas. Like I was like I feel like I'm playing an MMO that I am like 20 years late to, and everyone else is <laughs> logged off. And I'm just like, yeah. have you guys heard of this Morrowind thing? It's pretty sick, actually. And everyone's like, yeah, we played that when we were all like 12 years old. Um, but yeah. Even past like the feeling of it, like you're saying, Frank, in your pretty early days, so I'm not sure how far this like actually yeah. impacts it. But you can kill story NPCs and still play yes. the game. How, how does that work? Yes. I don't know. So that's what I have to find out is the ox cart driver's yeah. dead and I didn't revive him. So I don't like you committed a know, mass so, so, murder, left no witnesses. Somebody has to report so, it. So. Yeah, so, like, apparently there's a, I don't know if it's guaranteed story stuff, but there's an event in the game where something can happen and a lot of people in the town can die. And you have to then do another side quest to then revive everyone in the town. Um, It's so funny, I even tried doing a quest and I got locked in a prison and I had to sneak out. And, like, 
it, it was just I don't know, like so I'm still discovering it. I think there is a main quest. <laughs> there is, but I'm just like it's like playing Vice City as a kid. It's like I don't know. I just want to do the side stuff and I'm leveling up. Um, but I'm curious what happens if it's like you have to make a new character. There's only one save, yeah. so I I don't I, I think if he really jam and you kill a story NPC, I'm assuming then if you truly run out of other side stuff to do, you have no choice but then to spend spend a wake stone to revive that NPC and then continue the story. Oh, okay. um, and I don't know the process of getting these revive crystals. Apparently, it takes a long time, so you want it, so it's not worth it. Or but, you could um, spend three yeah. forty nine and buy. Yeah. I don't know. Is this so? What you yeah, mentioned the no, microtransactions? What's going on with that? How much does that matter? So they never they they never force it to you in your game. Okay. I've not used it. I didn't do my I didn't do microtransactions in Dragon's Dogma one. I don't think that was an option. So maybe that's also why people are mad. It's like okay, now you're doing this, but like, yeah, I don't I don't know. I haven't had to if I am truly tired or whatever. But it's like, yeah, no, I I, I reloaded. I I lost in a boss fight yesterday. I was mad, but then I reloaded my save and tried again. And it was fun. No, actually, I reloaded and ran away. But I don't know. So I, you're not forced to. If you truly are screwed or, or, or you can, but I don't know. It's, it's, I bought the main game and I'm having no, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm being forced. I don't feel like there's an unnecessary grind. It doesn't feel like one of those situations. It's just like, here's extra stuff if you want it. I've been having fun just by killing stuff, not even feeling like grinding, just exploring. And I have, I feel like I have enough gold rift crystals, which are the, is the currency used to hire AI NPCs. Um, I still have a wake stone. So if I need to revive or whatever, I can use it. But yeah, I think, I think. I didn't look at the list, but I know that's why a lot, I feel it I, to me it seems like the two reasons people were mad about Dragon's Dogma's release was really poor performance, which I, I like on again on PS5. It's like 30 frames. I think they're putting a patch to turn off ray tracing and stuff. It feels like a 360 game in terms of like it's how Dragon's Dogma was. I'm fine with it. Even Red Dead 2 ran at like 30 frames on console. But if you're a PC gamer and you max out your PC and you're still not hitting 60, I get why you're pissed. I get it. Yeah. Uh, and then seeing the l- long list of microtransactions is funny, funny and silly. You don't have to engage with that at all. You can keep enjoying the game. So yeah, DMC I have not five had it. that, right? Like, yeah, and I, I never, like I never spent. I, I, yeah, Capcom always does it. I, with Resident Evil, they'll actually offer like bonus costumes and music, and I'll buy that. That's like down. That's actual DLC, but yeah. I've never had to do like. I try, like Fortnite, but that's cosmetics. I don't think I've ever had to like. Mm, I want to beat this game. Let me buy some points. I don't think I've ever done that in any I, game. I do ever. feel like uh, here's my take on the microtransactions thing. I think it's like I I totally understand that like games are super expensive to make and they have to monetize the fuck out of them. Especially like yeah. a game like this that like looks incredible and is immense in scale and takes like hundreds and hundreds of people who are very technically gifted to make it. Um, I I feel like it is like. Not to make like a fucking slippery slope argument. I, I, in my mind, uh, microtransactions when they're purely cosmetic bothers me less. Cause like, yeah, if someone wants to like dress yeah. up Leon Kennedy, like a cheerleader for $3, like more power to you. Um, when it, it becomes in-game items, I think it does skirt dangerously close to a line where, uh, it, I, I could see it crossing over into the development process where they're like. You know, yeah. I'm not saying Dragon's Dog like, does this, but in yeah. a game where you can, dial, make this yeah. suck more so that exactly. you want to spend money. Like if, if this was more arduous than, or like this is too convenient. No one's going to buy the like crystals that allow you to create more war points and stuff. Um, I don't have any, I'm not saying that happened in Dragon's Dogma. It's not my experience so far. And I, I have seen no evidence that that is the case, but I do understand why people have uh, reservations about, about microtransactions that skirt into like, affecting actual game design decisions. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think as long as the game is, if the game is designed in a vacuum without that as an element, and they're like, this is the perfect balance for the game to be played without microtransactions. And then they're like, and if you want it to be easier, three bucks, I have yeah. less of a problem with that. It's just one of those black box things where it's kind of like, I I, I don't think we'll ever be able to determine uh, if that, like what the development process was like, what those conversations were like, whether there is like pressure from like publishers or marketers on developers to change game mechanics around that stuff. So it's, it's just, it's it an interesting funny. discussion. It's not as black and white as like microtransactions, bad microtransactions. Good. No, yeah. No. They, they got us though. They got us. Eh? Cause, cause 10, 15 years ago, the thing you just said of, I don't mind it so much if it's cosmetic would have got you. You would have been in the town square. People would have been throwing Molotov okay, cocktails here's, that you put together here's when my, you were 14 Here's the you. real take is that I fucking hate all that shit, but I'm tired yeah. of being a cranky old man. And I don't, I don't, <laughs> it's not the hill I want to die on. And I also Fair. like, it, it is like a lesser of two evils where it's like, you know, cause like, I also don't like the influencer marketing stuff for this game. Uh, I was just going to ask about that. Did and, you run into Asmongold? Is that why no, you didn't well, like the beginning the of the game like, so much? It's totally a la carte. Like I don't have to. I there's no screen yeah. that I run into where they're like, and and my lord, Asmund Gold is waiting for you. Like it doesn't happen. Like that would be fucking insane. 
Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The the my feeling about it is that I feel. I mean, it taps into the conversation we had a couple podcasts ago with Danny about um, influencers becoming publishers, where it's like there is a relationship between uh, consumers of content and content creators that verges into parasocial sometimes. And it is a different relationship than the than the relationship between content consumers and like Capcom, like publishers or like big corporate entities. There is something about it that is like cult of personality driven, which I don't think is inherently bad. There are like notable or famous like artists and developers and writers that I really like. And I'm like, that's like a cool person. I'm glad that there's cool people out there. I like their work. I like to follow their work. Um, But it does, it does feel a little weird to me when it's like, and also like your best friend is in the game. You're, you know, that person that like doesn't know you exist, but you like watch them every day. It just, it, it sits a little weird with me. Like the whole influencer marketing thing in general. I understand someone called me a dinosaur on Twitter. I'm fucking 33. <laughs> I like it. I, awesome. I actually you might was, as well be a hundred years old on the internet. If, I thought it was so funny. Hey, if, uh, I was like, if dinosaurs still existed, humans would be extinct. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, dude, he's intimidating. You're saying you're the dude, alpha yeah, predator. I should have like, yeah. replied, yeah, I'm a fucking T-Rex, dude. What of it? There you go. Yeah, yeah bro. Yeah. Uh, but no, I just like, I don't know. It's not, again, it's not a hill I want to die on. And like, I understand that people have different feelings about that shit. And like, <laughs> like some influencer retweeted my tweet that was shitting on it, which I thought was like, in my mind, tweeting about it and being like, this shit sucks. It was like, I was like yeah. in the bathroom stall as a teenager being like, fuck, fuck authority. Like, I wasn't thinking too much about it. I just think it sucks. That's my gut feeling like, you know, shooting from the hip feeling about it. But then like an influencer who uh, had their like pawn in the game was like, I'm sick of this like negativity. And it's like, I just don't want to like argue with fucking people. It's exhausting. Yeah. yeah. See, like the, even with the cosmetics is like, I made my character. I made Mina Shirakawa. I was going to ask. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I made, I made Mina Shirakawa. She's extremely cute. Um, um, and then for my pawn, I made Haley Williams from Paramore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's great because it's just Haley and it just says Paramore. But then yeah, that shows up in other players' games. So I had a friend on my friends list send me a video of him questing with That's Paramore. Amazing. And it's like, so again, it's like, yeah, that, that stuff is in there, but it's like make you can make it's easy to make cooler people than influencers. Yeah. Well, that's that's the funny so, thing is yeah. like it, it that feels so different to me if it's like because if it's like um if it's a vector for people's creativity for them to express like their love of a person or like or to like do something funny if you make like a weird atrocity pawn and it's yeah, like yeah. so fucked up looking and your friends is like why would you do this like to me it doesn't seem like Dragon's Dogma is about like total immersion like i feel like the like silliness of it and the camp of it is yeah. part of the appeal which i think is cool I, I the the thing that it like verges into discomfort for me is when that is used to by a corporation that is tapped into as like it's like the hey fellow kids thing where they're like oh isn't that like silly that your favorite is that like xqc is in this game and it's like even, whether no matter how you feel about those people it still just does feel like a very like cynical marketing tactic where they're like tapping into people's parasocial attachment to these people and they're like I'm trying to think of like an example where a corporation do- like when corporations do memes like when a meme happens on the internet oh, and everyone's yeah, like yeah. Oh, that's pretty funny for two days and then like six weeks later Mountain Dew sorry Mountain Dew is like hey this remember <laughs> they're this catching meme? strays on this podcast yeah, sorry Mountain Dew I know you guys are big into like pachinko and the gaming scene but um but anyway yeah it just feels like corporations doing a meme and it feels like it's like to me it feels a little uh, crass well even well, it's like even Yakuza, I don't know, like Yakuza will put New Japan pro wrestler character, like, I, I don't know, I feel like, I don't know, I, I think it's just I'm not a consumer of, like, YouTube influencers, so for me, I'm just like, I don't care about yeah. any of these people, but if it was, like, someone I was into, I was like, yeah, that's cool, but that's why you just make them, so, I don't know, I, but also maybe it's it doesn't cost Capcom anything to be like, hey, can we have your likeness, Mr. Who, Mr. Jazz Gamer or yeah. whatever, like, and it's like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's but, interesting, too, because, like, the, I've, I have different feelings, like, when I played Yakuza, um, I think it was in Kiwami one that has like the famous judo guy mm-hmm. in it. And like, I didn't know who that was. And I was like, Oh, that's an interesting cameo that like he pops up, but I guess it would cross that line. If then when they were marketing Kiwami one, they were like, and see your favorite judo star. And then they had him on the commercial. And he was like, I love Yakuza. It's like the best game. Like, I think that's where it gets weird. I don't, cause I don't mind cameos. Like I think Aaron Hansen yeah. from game Grumps is a voice actor and he does has like voice acting cameos in a lot of games. Yeah. And that doesn't bother me because he like, that's like his that's one of his like creative outlets like he's bringing his talents to bear in that thing i think that that i've because i've been analyzing this a lot i think the thing that bothers me is when it's like there's not an element of like 
creativity that that person is loading to it. They're just like putting their face on it. They're like a like a micro mascot for the game, you know? It's like there's there's no element of like I love this game so much, let me express my love for it. I mean, I guess like creating a pawn could be seen as creativity, but I guess I don't know. It's up in the air. It's it's like the billboards in Burnout Paradise for me. Like I see it and I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I guess vote for Obama or like Monster <laughs> Energy Drink and Death Stranding. It's like, sure, yeah. this person was asked to be in the thing and maybe received some monetary, you know, incentive to to do so. Yeah. I just don't get what the point of it is. You know, like if it's an advertising thing, people who were gonna buy the game are they really gonna be like, oh shit, like fuck yeah, like Jazz Jazz Hunter nine oh five is in it? Yeah. Like whoa. <laughs> Oh, dude, I love that guy on Twitch. He has like 8 million followers. Now I'm going to spend 100 yeah. Canadian dollars on this game. I don't see how that works as a, from a marketing perspective. I think it probably just puts the game on people's radar. If I had to be, if I had to devil's advocate yeah. my own like point, I, I would say it probably is just like, someone's like, oh, they like see a ad for Dragon's Dogma 2. They're like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll check that out. And then it's like the, um, it's like, the more you see the Coca-Cola billboards, the more the logo seeps into your fucking like union unconscious. And then you're like out at a fucking vending machine. You're like, what should I? Oh, yeah, that's the that's the, I recognize that logo because I've seen right. it four billion times. So, yeah, I think it's like, I don't know, maybe like wearing down the like not resistance to those things, but it's just like it's in your it's in your mind. It's top of mind as marketing people like to say. Well, I think for us, it's also like, well, it's like. To me, I just see it's not clear because it doesn't get in the way. But to me, it's just like, OK, I, I'm I was already all in on Dragon's Dogma without this extra layer of stuff. So for me, I can just ignore yeah, it. Who so really it's cares? Like, yeah, it's not getting us in the door. But hey, but if it does get a few people in the door, that's true. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, that, that, at yeah, the maybe. end of the day, video games are fucking expensive to make. And I totally yeah. understand yeah. that. And I am I am grateful to be so like I was reading recently that one of the James Bond movies had a uh, had a Heineken sponsorship. That was like they had like James Bond drinking a Heineken in it. I haven't seen the movie. I don't know how prominent it is, but I guess it funded like more than half of the production budget and it's like wow. i i do enjoy big budget spectacle games and movies and stuff and it's like if the you know if if that is truly what it takes to make that thing happen like if dragon talk about two couldn't happen if they didn't have like influencers in it or whatever if that's the thing that tips the needle over then like it is it, i understand it more even if i don't personally like it or whatever yeah that reminds me of the um passage that video game by jason Rohr came out in 2007, uh, it had, <laughs> I'm trying to make sure I'm, I'm getting this right, but I, I'm pretty sure I remember, uh, it had like Campbell's tomato soup cans in it or something. <laughs> like it had some kind of, it, I guess this goes back w way far, right? Of like games having to include things to pay for them and, and whatever, uh, you know, whatever way it works. I, I'm personally less interested in influencer marketing inside of games and more interested in influencer marketing in the marketing yeah. because having Lil Wayne do the advertising for Street Fighter 6 made me way more excited for Street Fighter 6 or like uh, T-Pain doing Crusader Kings or the guy who's the guy from Succession that just did uh, Tekken 8 uh, uh, yeah, I don't know his name but, oh. talking about. but yeah, yeah Logan, that yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah, one yeah. or or uh the, the one for, fuck, it doesn't matter. for I think for Dragon's yeah, Dogma, wasn't there another, wasn't like, there like Ian McKellen or something? Something yeah. like that. But that's, like, um, that's like the talent thing that I'm talking about, where it's, like, they're, it's yeah, not they're only is it external something to, it. to the game, but, like, that works because it's, like, you know, it's, like, the, when you if you had, like, fucking, I'm trying to think of, I don't know anything about painting. If you had a famous painter who's still alive, I was gonna say Pablo Picasso, because I don't know any painters after, like, 1940, but if you had, like, a famous painter, and they painted, like, the cover art for... You know, like, like fucking didn't Mobius do like Panzer Dragoon art or something. If they promoted sure. that, that fucking rocks. Cause that's like, we have like yeah. someone doing their thing here. And, but it's like, yeah, when they're not like bringing their creative talents to bear is like, it feels different. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's tough out there. I hope they, uh, I hope they do well though. I hope Dragon's Dogma 2, uh, succeeds and gets way more sales than the first one. And we get a Dragon's Dogma 3 before 2050. Uh, any final thoughts on the game, Frank, before we, uh, get to the questions? Yeah, I'm I'm eager to play more. I'm eager for them to put out that performance patch. So if it makes a difference if I turn off like motion bloom and ray tracing if it if it runs better, but like I've had no issues with it. Again, like Monster Hunter World I played on a PC that did not run well. So again, like I don't know, I'm a big Capcom fan, so I'm I just I'm very stoked on it, but I get if people are mad about it, but performance, but if you're wary because of my transactions, like the influencer pawns, yeah. just ignore it. Like it's not it's not going to be in your face. Like 
I appreciate that. Like when I died, it's like, you want to use a wake stone? No, it, it was not like go to the PlayStation store. That's not. Uh, that's not. That does not. Okay, happen. good. So it's it's not. It's at not all. like Candy like, Crush. Oh, you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's not. You can buy the sword if you have the digital. Like even Mortal Kombat does that, and that kind of is like. Lame. Wait, sorry. Like, what Mortal, Mortal Kombat, Kombat does what? Mortal Kombat has the thing of like, oh, if you want our supreme currency, you can buy easy fatalities. You can buy these costumes. And I love Mortal Kombat, but it's like they put in front of you that you have a the top right of the screen. It's like you have zero of our super premium currency. Whereas in Dragon's Dogma, it doesn't matter. You know, like there's so many currencies in Mortal Kombat. It's ridiculous. But again, if you just grind, it's but th that stuff's a little too in your face. I'm yeah. like, OK, I don't need I, just, I don't need to pay fun. money for just easy the fatalities. Like, even as game, someone I'm like so sucks. highly skeptical of microtransactions. And even I feel like Dragon's Dogma has not pushed it on me. No, good. No. Not so. It's no. It's no Ubisoft game. Then it's no. No, see that. I that's hate, the yeah. worst one, man. God. Assassin's Creed Origins. And yeah. as soon as you finish the prologue, they stop the screen and they're like, "Have you purchased the season pass?" <sighs> Do they really? It sucks. Assassin's that's just Creed yeah. Origins, dude. Fuck off. Sorry. No, dude, even Ubisoft games, when you boot up a Ubisoft game, it's like, do you have Rainbow Six? Yep. Do you have Assassin's Creed? It's I, like, dude, the Xbox, I'm the gonna... Xbox is doing that now. When you turn the Xbox Series X on for a couple of weeks, it was like, Call of Duty, now out, before you even get to the fucking home screen of your console. That's awesome. Like a... <laughs> That's awesome. I, I feel like <laughs> when I fire up a game like that, I it's I feel That's like I'm playing so like cool. a, like the home screen for those games feels like I'm like looking at fucking Hulu and being served ads or something. Oh, it's, it's yes. like Huluification oh. of video games i hate it everything's gonna have a 30 second ad you got to drink your verification can like i'm, I'm enjoying it would be coke. funny if you if you if you beat a game it just auto plays the next game like <laughs> next to the dashboard <laughs> like credits are falling yeah. yeah. the the yeah, 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 demo five yeah, yeah, yeah. starting in three yeah, seconds yeah. <laughs> hey we're getting there i mean with the xbox you can switch games no i love yeah. I, know, I, I appreciate it. it's nice to come back and talk about video games from this like so, like so, silly cultural lens so it's like that's yeah. kind of nice um so that's oh, yeah. fun yeah all right, Dragon's uh, Dogma 2. Buy it now on, what's it on? It's on Steam, Xbox, PS5. Steam, Xbox, PS5. Yeah. I'm playing on PS5. Uh, yeah, I do not know the PC performance issues, so it's the the, the reviews are very mixed over uh, there. But My guess would like be bad. Game. My experience has been yeah. that it has been mostly pretty good, but when you get closer to like cities and stuff, it starts dragging down. People, I also, yeah. one of the things that's worth mentioning before we move on is that uh, there, this is kind of a funny emergent phenomenon, is I guess like the number of NPCs that are within like the LOD chunking of the game is what's slowing it down a lot of the times. So people are just like mass slaughtering NPCs to make the, gu the game more performant, which I think is like Whoa. that fucking rules. I love shit like that. That's, I think that's so pretty funny. funny. Yeah. <laughs> that's the power of emergent game design baby see that's that's the next thing they got to start putting in in uh, emergent sims is making it so you got to kill things to yeah the game runs slow unless you become a horrible person yeah that's how they incentivize you to kill things in the next dishonor dude game, that's it okay hard. that's the new morality system that's the new like paragon <laughs> system is like <laughs> it's not just like you don't get like the fable devil horns or whatever the game just like runs way better damn dude yeah. that would be a hard decision to make finally Video games have hard hard choices to make. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's Dragon's Dogman too. It sounds exciting. I'm I'm probably gonna pick it up when it's not a hundred Canadian dollars after yeah. taxes. Uh, but we do have some questions, some emails, some some things that people have sent in. Thank you so much, Frank. Yeah, we got one one, one email uh, from uh, Dom. If people do want to email us, podcast at noclip.video or in our Discord channel or leave YouTube comments, we can pick some. Uh, so Dom had a question. Hey, gang, got a question for you. With how frequently you guys are exposed to both the AAA and indie realms, I'm dying to know how you all feel about this. AI tools for all their faults can provide massive levels of support and productivity in these studios. Working on projects and tools like Unreal, Unity, Godot, Blender all continue to push the bar of what's available for free. With a seeming implosion brewing in the AAA world and feels like an unending stream of multi-million dollar flops and layoffs, huge pools of talented developers looking for work. Pow World proving gamers are hungry and willing to sample familiar flavors outside the name brands. Do you guys think a new indie renaissance could be upon us? Games like FTL, Fez, Super Meat Boy, and Stardew help kick off a prior generation's renaissance. In a more recent history, we have games like Pizza Tower, Dredge, and Inscription continuing to push the bar on what good design could do with a small scale. I like to think the pot is simmering just, just right to let even more talent bubble to the top of the indie game scene. All right, wall of text over. Love the channel. Thanks for reading. With much love, Dom Korea. Hey. Um... And then they, they also say, when will you boys man up and tackle the guilty pleasure that is the jank of Musao gangs like like Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, I'll have to get back in the yeah. Dynasty Warrior games. Defeat Lu Bu. Yeah, that's a good question. Also, thank you for bolding the question so I know what to put in the chapter marker yeah, on yeah. YouTube. Um, yeah. So what do we think uh, regarding there being an indie renaissance? I think... Um, I think this kind of thing comes up a lot. I remember when we had the kind of big indie renaissance in like 2000, 
eight, nine, ten. There was that like period of time where it was kind of art house, and then I think access to them became kind of the big thing. The um, humble bundles that made them really yeah. cheap it was like a dollar to play some of the best indie games of all time. But also, were they the best because they were a dollar and everyone played them, right? So there's there's a lot of factors there. I think we're at a point where people personally uh, are tired of playing playing and paying for $90 video games, you know, $70 video games that aren't finished, that aren't, um, aren't, aren't seemingly worth your time playing. Like, you know, as excited as, as I was for uh suicide squad and I'm still willing to play that game cause I enjoyed the beta of it that I played. Um, it's still like way too much money and it you know, compared to something like uh Bellatro, which is $15 and I have 300 hours in it's like, obviously hours are not, you know, that's not how you have to determine if something's worth your money or worth playing, but I'm having so much more fun playing these smaller games, these games that like have a scope and feel like they're trying to do something and say something and aren't just, they don't just feel like they're designed by committee. Like suicide squad is obviously still done by a ton of talented people who artists, designers, QA people who who tried their best to to make it feel great. And I think in the end, it, it does feel great. Um, whether or not you like what it's doing comes down to your own preferences. You know, not everything needs to be a job, but also like it's still like a ton of money. Like, if you want to play because it's multiplayer, if you want to play that game in the way that I think is the most fun, which is with your friends. And this is kind of where I'm trying to walk this conversation is look at Helldivers 2. That game is forty dollars and it kicks ass. And it's fun the whole way through. And like it never stops being fun unless you find that, you know, grinding not particularly enjoyable. But like playing with your friends is like free. It's automatically fun. And when the cost to get in is like 120 bucks among you rather than 300, 400 plus the season pass. Plus, you got to buy the super cool Joker. No, the Joker update's free. But like stuff like that. Right. I, I think we're at a point where people are, are more willing to spend ten dollars on something that kicks ass. Do I think we're in a renaissance? I don't know. I think I think indie games have only been getting better and better every year consecutively since I've been playing video games. Um, whether or not they're going to overtake AAA games, I don't think that will really ever be the case. It's, you know, it comes down to marketing, right? Who has the money? Who's willing to pay investors to be in their video games? Uh, that's not going to be, you know, <laughs> games that just happen to make a million sales. Like for Bellatro and its success and its quality, they did not expect that to sell a million copies in two weeks. You know, the Playstack, the publisher, they didn't expect that to happen. It just happened because it was really good and it got in front of the right uh, set of people. We can view those random, you know, Michael Jordan moments and say, oh, that's that's what basketball is like, baby. Everyone's that good. But that's just it, it's all random chance and hard work, of course, plays into it a lot. But it, it's not something that I think is just going to be a, a broad thing that happens with with that section of the games industry. Uh, that's That might just be me. What do you guys think on that? Yeah, Frank, you go first. Yeah, for me, it's just it's the same thing with like studying film. There's always going to be phenomenal shit. Yeah. It's just a matter of like who is spending the time digging through the crates, finding it, and then platforming it. There is always phenomenal stuff. And like for me, it's like when I think of the indie renaissance, to me, it's like, oh yeah, Xbox yeah. Live Arcade was yeah. like, I didn't grow up with a gaming PC. I had like it could barely run Counter Strike Source. So it's like I was never super hopped on Steam. I still try to play stuff, which is like it was just kind of inaccessible. Xbox Live Arcade was like, I mean, these games are all backed by Microsoft, but it's like, oh, Super Meat Boy I got to play and Geometry Wars, but like these small bite-sized games. And then finally got a gaming PC. Yeah, the Hummel Bundle, Steam sales. But I think like with the micro budget games or just budget games, you can sample a lot of stuff so that, yeah, so many more people are willing to jump on Bellatro as opposed to like 70 bucks for Dragon's Dogma, which I get and cards, you know. So like, I think there's always great stuff. So I, I don't know if it's like, I think we're in an endless renaissance. Maybe yeah. post Humble Bundle, the renaissance never stopped. Games became so cheap. It's just a matter of like time and attention what gets the love and then a what gets funding or whatever like and then, and then like jason schreier talked a lot about in his book about like the development of stardew valley but it's like yeah right now some kids working on a game for seven years and it's going to come out and blow us away like so i i appreciate this question's hopeful because i get tired when people are like are video games over yeah. it's like when's the crash bro just, yeah 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 it's yeah. just like there's always good shit and again like I, that's the one thing i really pride with no clip like i i'm always eager on just i don't know the, i i like dumb triple a stuff but it's like i really appreciate everyone else like really diving into indie games and like thank you guys like because also like our game game of the year stuff it's like nine out of ten indie games yeah so and, and even what's what's the scale of indie again with funding one person a team power world what was the dive dave the diver yeah. you know yeah. whatever like even power world it's it's what is indie these days whatever what is not 70 dollars i don't know what is whatever mm. um but 
Yeah, I think we're in an endless renaissance with all media. Kids can make yeah. stuff on their phones. Like even with Roblox, kids are re- have access to like weird game concepts early, yeah. like just like flash games. Like so, the appetite's there. Gamers are there. Um, yeah, that's part of it too. Yeah, so is I never, the democratization yeah. of access to it, like being able to make games cheaper and easier. You know, things that used to take twelve people, not take one or two, because the tools have been so you know, they're ubiquitous. People understand how to use them. If you worked on one, you could use it the same tool, the same general purpose engine to make all this stuff. So there's more games, more creative people putting their their efforts out there for people to play. It makes it a lot easier. I also think you guys both kind of touched upon this, that um, that like as younger generations grow up with a different relationship to games, like um, the developer who made Lethal Company, uh, I believe was a Roblox dev f- prior to that and is like very, very yeah. young. I don't know exactly how old they are, but I think they're like, low 20s or something like that uh and that game made like billions and millions of dollars and has like so many fucking people playing it and it was a cultural phenomenon and i think like the interesting thing i've only dabbled in lethal company a little bit but the interesting thing about it is it has such a strong sense of place that even though the gameplay itself is very kind of simplistic and minimal and it's like kind of just like walking into scary places and grabbing stuff and leaving um i think that like the idea of games as like a as like a, th- a third place is how a lot of people are talking about it, like filling the role as like a digital coffee shop or a digital bar or like a digital library. Um, I, I think younger people are growing up with games as more of a role like that, because when I was a kid, like fucking hopping on Battle.net for Diablo 2 was like mind blowing that there were people like trading stones of Jordan in the chat. And I was like, this is this is like crazy. Like it was like it felt like a totally new thing. And I think just having that as kind of like the passive background state opens those people up to like new forms of expression where there's less pressure on the game itself to be like, and you're constantly being fed loot and there's like this happening. And there's like, uh, like lethal company is almost like the genius of it is, is, is it's minimalism and it's commitment to just being like, this is a place where you can spend time with your friends. And like a lot of the immersion gameplay is just how much you and your friends talk and laugh and have like funny moments occur. And it's like, it's kind of just like the less pressure on the game to be gamey and more of like freedom to just have it be like a place where you spend time or something. So, I think as like younger generations who have a different relationship to games and to making games, especially in game making tools come up, we'll see mm-hmm. a, a sort of like a blossoming of different like diversification of genres and like new genres and new subgenres popping up that we just like no one had thought of or explore. I mean, that's how like that's how fucking art works, right? Like, you know, Star yeah. Wars emerged out of like pulp serial science fiction and Westerns and just like it's it's synthesizing and resynthesizing old and new things and putting them in new forms. And like occasionally there are just like these kind of hard to predict blossomings of creativity that just strike a chord with people. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I am hopeful that indie games will continue to be as they have been throughout my lifetime or like the last uh, decade and a half, especially uh, a place for like like an accelerator and incubator for weird new challenging ideas because because if you made Lethal Company and the budget of it was five hundred million dollars and people's like mortgages and their like child like college payments were on the line and stuff, there I it's harder to take risks when there's that much on the line, which is why like you see more risk taking in smaller projects. So I think uh yeah, yeah. we're we're living through the it, the indie renaissance is like just indie games in general, and I think we'll continue to see that grow and evolve. Yeah, for sure. Well put. Well put. I think uh, to what you're saying about the the funding part of it and like the 500 million dollar game thing like there's so many layoffs and you know people are like oh phil spencer thinks the industry's uh, not going in a great direction and th- it's like what's the safe bet for triple a i thought i was playing the safe bets yeah. you know what is the safe bet going to be maybe funding new weird small things more pentiments and fewer halo infinites Dude, I, I would so. not be opposed to that yeah, <laughs> yeah that, no that i we've like talked about this on the podcast before but i i think that like having smaller internal studios in large studios is a good idea because it allows like um the pentiment doc which is coming out soon um uh, josh Sawyer talks about how like he was so burned out on doing these giant games and just went to management was like i just need to do something that is like driven by passion and smaller and manageable and the team for that game is like a dozen people like it's insane what they pulled off and i think that like having that opportunity for people to like stretch their creative wings in different ways with less pressure on them, less financial pressure. And like, yeah, it just, it yields more interesting games. Even if you don't like Pentiment, even if you're like one of the people who's like, Oh, why would I like read a book when I could play like a video game? (laughs) It's like the, the, the people who make those big games that you do love, like those people should be allowed the freedom to work at different uh, scales of economy or whatever the fuck, uh, in order to like explore new ideas and stuff. And I think as a studio, 
you know, having more of those smaller pods within it, it not only breeds innovation, but it also like, I don't know. I think we need to change our relationship to like photorealism in games too. I think it puts such a pressure on like iterating assets for games. And that's like such a bottleneck and it takes so much time that, uh, yeah, I don't know. We need to convince people like my brother who just play like only triple A games that like, if a game looks like it came out in 1997, that's not a bad thing. Yeah, it's like black and white movies. They're still good. Yeah, just because you can't totally. see the color. The Lighthouse. I haven't seen it. I've heard it's good though. But like, it's good. I remember in elementary school we watched Twelve Angry Men, and everyone was like, "Why is this on? It's in black and white." I'm like, "This is one of the greatest films I've ever seen in my hey, life." Shut up. Have back some there. respect. Yeah, I'm gonna turn it to one of the guys in the movie. I'm gonna ask you, <laughs> where were you on the night of October seventh? It's uh, you and eleven uh, people we'll debating if it. it's a bad movie. That's yeah, yeah. like <laughs> brutal. Anyway, yeah, yeah indie games. Although are great. it would be funny to. It would be funny to show someone clerks and say it was made in the 40s. <laughs> <laughs> These are convenience stores were like back then. They were, they were imagining wow. VHS players. They're just or, or like VCRs, us. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dom, for that uh, fantastic question. Got our noggins jogging. Uh, yeah. Like Frank said, if you want to send us more questions, podcast at noclip.video, join the Discord, drop them on YouTube, tweet them at us. I don't know. Carrier pigeon. Send me a letter if you can find my address. It's an ARG. Good luck. Uh, no clip stuff. We've got a lot going on. That's a podcast, though. Uh, thank you so much for listening. There's a lot of stuff going on still, despite the fact that, uh, again, Danny, who hopefully uh, is recovering by the time this podcast is out and is uh, taking some time to just get better, just focus on getting better. Uh, cause I know, and, and not to get back on packs, but also to get back on packs a little bit. Uh, the devs there that I spoke to, everyone didn't just have nice things to say about Danny, but about the whole team and the oh. stuff that everyone does here, the hard work that we put in, they acknowledge it. Everyone was like, you make a doc about my game. And then they'd be like, I'm joking. But also like, I would follow it up and be like, we would love to like, like genuinely, mm -hmm. I wish that we had more time, more energy, to do more stuff, right? To, to if, if we could all clone ourselves a hundred times or hire more people and have more money, patreon.com slash no clip, it would be great to like do more things. And I know that's where Danny's head is. Like he is constantly yeah. trying to figure out how to cover more games, how to get in more places, how to cross the globe and like do bigger, more exciting things and, and talk about the games that, that shaped us, that shaped the industry. Um, so, you know, I, I, if he's listening to this, if he's not, it's all good. I understand I, you have not a whole lot of energy, man. Take it easy. But we, we just, we appreciate and love everything that you've done for us personally. I assume, I've, I think I speak for everyone that he's given us tons of great opportunities and also for everything that you've done for the industry, man. So, you know, take it easy, take yeah. a, take a break and, and get better. Just focus on that. Um, so, so thank you. That's my little rant on on Danny getting better he has no choice now I've said it all uh but we are we are still doing stuff Jane Dev part four question mark I have two of them there because I'm so excited <laughs> Jeremy is that is that happening on crew yeah I actually yeah so it's been over a year since the last Jane Dev we took a break from it but we've kind of like re reinvigorated uh the crew channel uh so I started working on a script like a couple months ago and uh, I've kind of been just like busy with other projects and my family came into town and we had a bunch of filming trips and stuff um but uh, I have a, a strong sense of what it's going to be. I'm going to try to get it uh, get it finished up this week. Um, yeah, it's kind of yeah. it's a very like I'm like a little scared about it because it's like a very fucking like ruthless interrogation of my feelings about like what game dev is to me, because it's something that I take very, very fucking seriously. And I spend an absurd amount of time on. And it's like I am trying to find where that line is between like, how do I take this seriously enough that it can be? a part of because I don't want it to be like a fucking thing where I'm like oh and how marketable is this game idea but I also think that like if you're really serious about a creative pursuit um then like examining the idea of like someday monetizing it is not is not just like this thing where it's like you're like selling out your pure creativity it's like no if I made money off this I would be able to devote more of myself to it uh so it's kind of like interrogating what my relationship is to that and saying like you know, how, how much of myself do I want to give to this? How seriously can I take it? How can I take it more seriously? And also just like showing off a million cool things that I've made over the last year and a half. Damn dude, deep funding, something we've been talking about a lot for the last little while. So that'll be cool to think about the, the monetary aspect of it as well. I'm a sicko for Jane Dev. So <laughs> I, I'm a <laughs> sicko you, for dude. anything you make, man. I'm, Thank I'm just you, excited. Dude. I need more. That's make it an nice hour thing. long. Make it, make a feature film about making indie I'll games. I'll make it as make long it as I can. 
for just Call for you. Call it indie game the movie. Yeah. Maybe don't actually. It's nine hours. Uh, <laughs> do we have anything else going on? Cruise? No, right? We're just, we're just we're just taking it easy. But we're gonna find we're gonna find some fun stuff. Maybe we'll do some quick looks. Who knows? Yeah. Um, I got some another no fast session proper. at some point probably. Oh yes. Yeah. I. Uh, what yeah. is it this time? I haven't decided on a game yet. I have a list. I have a running list of games that I would either like to stream or play on fast session. And uh, yeah, it's got to be that right mix of like. It can't be too like I want to play fucking Mystical Ninja for the N sixty four, but no one put Goemon. Yeah, yeah, but nobody cares okay. about that game. But so it's I, like you. Okay, well, it's yeah. No, that's why. Yeah, I want to. Okay, see cool. Yeah, well, yeah. I just that's why you I, should that's, do exactly. I want to like do shit like that, but I want it. I'm trying to find the balance where it's like I don't want people to be like, why the fuck would I click on this? Because it's like. I don't know. Maybe I'm like undervaluing people's curiosity or something. So, yeah. Dude, you, I, I know this isn't how it works, but you made Heroes of Might and Magic 3 <laughs> popular again. If you Google Heroes fault. of Might and Magic 3, my face comes up now. It's that so embarrassing. It's so fucking I embarrassing. Mean, it's it's the truth, uh, but we do still have stuff coming up for no clip. Uh, the Pentiment documentary, speaking of uh, the early access, is live on the Patreon, so you can check that out now. The full what did it end up being? Fifty minutes or something like that? No, I think it's like an hour right? and twenty. Is it an the hour? The cut that I sent Danny was an hour thirty four. Uh, Holy smokes! And then he did a little massaging on it because uh, yeah, I I don't know how many people have edited a feature length documentary, but it's typically not something that one person does across the course of a month. It's like fucking. It's good to have other people look at it and be like, this could be shorter. They, you know what I mean. So, but I, right. I'm excited to Cut watch this his, part the, the O'Dwyer cut. <laughs> yeah exciting stuff you can check that out like i said on the patreon um i guess we're still there's a bunch of stuff that's like right there that's like like 80 percent of the work is 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 done right but you know Danny yeah needs to we filmed a bunch of cool shit at gdc so. too i don't yeah think i wanted to talk about i don't that think we've well. announced the documentary that it was for yet i don't know danny's not here so no. i can't ask him so i can't say what it was for but like even though we had to cut filming short we did manage to talk to a lot of really really cool people uh and yeah so that's kind of all i can say about it but we we got some good shit so i'm uh i'm excited also the i i I have to ask Danny's permission to talk about this, but the most insane shit happened around the filming space. And I need to like that. I have a crazy GDC story, but I need Danny's permission for it. So I'm just planting okay. the seed that, uh, yeah, something, some crazy. Ha- I shouldn't even fucking, that's so fucking rude to like, tease. <laughs> now you've set it up now. Now people are going to wonder what it is, uh, but now the pressure's on we'll Danny out. to let me tell the story. Balls <laughs> in your court. O'Dwyer. also get that's better. Right. If you're listening to this, I hope you're fucked up on painkillers <laughs> and not in horrible pain. <laughs> Oh goodness! He'll he'll just write it in the comments. He'll just drop a big story. He's got it. <laughs> this is a super he's got fucked up comment with a bunch of misspellings. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> it's like more commas than you could ever need. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah, we still are working on Dear Dwyer, and by we I mean me at this point. Danny uh, somehow knew that like this was gonna happen. I feel like and recorded a bunch of stuff in advance and got a bunch of work done. So I'm I'm making my way through those podcasts as we speak. I'm I'm editing right now. Um, the first one on I believe Bellatro. That'll probably end up being the first episode. I'm I'm not you know publishing them so. I'm I'm not sure, but it feels like a good candidate for the first episode. Um, other ones on Pacific Drive, uh, Conversation with Reb Ford on uh, Warframe and Dave Oshry on New Blood, who I didn't get to meet at PAX, but I did play Fallen Aces, the game that they're publishing next. Uh, and that looked pretty sick. I played the demo, the demo for a was while fantastic. Back. It was fun. Dude, it's like it's like an immersive sim boomer shooter yeah it's really cool it's awesome and by immersive sim i mean you can jump on a box and enter a building through a different door dude there's i think i said that to the there's to the multiple guy was, doors <laughs> and at least one of them is a vent that's an immersive sim yeah as, as soon as there's two ways to enter a room it's an immersive sim that's how i feel about houses i'm like oh man dude this house is it's giving me big immersive sim vibes. you'd be such a good realtor uh, <laughs> with that with that logic <laughs> it's like an immersive sim it's like a one-story cape that's also an immersive sim right if you think about it it, it does have a back door so yeah how do you get it? Is it locked? Is it a number pad? What's choice the is number? Yours. 0451? Yeah. Whoa. Whoa yeah, dealer's sick. choice on that one. Hey, speaking of immersive Sims, Judas got, yeah. I'm very excited. I Ken Levine game. Whoa, the new one. <laughs> uh, it, it's, you know what? Bioshock in space. Is that what we're calling it now? Uh, Bioshock I, think, I think that's called space. System Shock. Whoa, settle down. Nobody play that one. Nobody's ever heard of, of System Shock. What is that? I've never, uh, I actually didn't oh. watch the Judas preview. I just saw people talking about it. It looks, it looks good. What are you? Let's watch it right now. Should we watch let's, it let's right lie. now? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, no, yeah, I, I I think it looks great. I think we need more immersive Sims in this world. Whatever I have to do to make it happen. Uh, whatever Wolf Eye Studio is working on next. Oh, yeah. Raphael Conantonio, man. Keep it, keep it light. Keep it tight. Keep it easy. Uh, support the podcast. 
we're, we're, we're just we're just riffing at this point. Uh, support the podcast, fun documentaries, get access to stuff. Like I said, the Pentiment Doc, it's up now. You can watch an early access version of it at patreon.com slash no clip. Follow us on Twitter at no clip video at Daniel Dwyer. Get updates, see how he's uh, how he's doing, how he's holding up. Uh, at Frank Howley, if you want to learn more about how sick it is to be in Japan and how 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 it's the greatest convention on earth. At Jeremy B. Jane, uh, for more hot takes on no, how never bad influencers again. are. It's not worth uh, it. Please comment on everything that he posts no. and tell him it was a bad Put post. Put influencer no, Jeremy in no your video. That's right, takes. baby. It's fu- from Put Jeremy Jane. Jeremy and Dude. Dragon's Dog. <laughs> yes. Okay. If, Make, they, said, if they put me in the game, I'm on board, baby. It's all influencer here, Here's the thing. If if you if you post a picture of Jeremy in Dragon's Dogma 2 that you've made in the character creator. No, don't do I will that. Send you, don't do that. I will I'm going to have a fucking $1. dissociative <laughs> nervous breakdown if you do that. Don't do that. <laughs> I will, I will, I will say it, I was all aboard Peach Milky and Yakuza. So if they did put Peach Milky and Dragon's Dogma, then they would have got me. They would have got me. That's, that is so, true. We, we ignored well, the greatest influencer marketing of all time. We'll have it's, to re, the, we'll have to circle back to this. We'll, we'll have to further refine where yeah. the line is on ethics, and I'm, I think we're getting close to yeah. figuring it out. <laughs> And you can follow me on Twitter at Garesha as well. I don't know. I post stuff from time to time. There's there's things. We're still calling it Twitter, by the way. We're not changing it. Yeah. Uh, that's the pod. What are you guys up to? Frank, what's your weekend look like? I'm still jet lagged, but there's a new Sydney Sweeney movie in theaters, Immaculate. I have to go see. There's no one who wants to go see it with me, so I will go. I'm gonna. It's going to be weird because I'm going to be a single guy by myself in an empty theater seeing Sydney Sweeney. <laughs> Nothing is going to happen except I'm going to be eating popcorn, but I'm excited to see Immaculate. You're going to be eating um, the popcorn out of the dune bucket. I'm I'm very yeah I don't know I'm excited um I don't know I'm still super jet lagged it's like I'm miserable but I'm getting better um and then um yeah I just went to it's so funny even after coming back to Japan I went to another nice. wrestling show so just it keeps me going it's fun it's the most cathartic thing in the world dude it's so, it's pure energy yeah. I, I watched uh, yeah, the, the Iron Claw even though it's depressing you're still like yeah, yeah. beat him up I, no I was, I was gonna say this weekend is the grand is Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling is hosting the Grand Princess Tournament. So that's going to be this weekend. It's like five hours of wrestling. I'm excited to watch from home streaming it. But awesome. So TJPW Grand Princess Tournament. Mia Watanabe will be the new champion. That's all right. You'll be you'll I'll be back it. there next I'll week. You you with the headphones on and your stardom merch, you, you look like you're, you're yeah. an event rep. So you're you're 99% yeah, of the way yeah. there. You just got to get back to Japan. Uh, Jeremy, what about always, you? Always. Uh, I hey. am. Oh, damn. We got all the fucking Joshis on screen. Yeah, man. Uh, is that a calendar? <laughs> oh, it is. It's the it's the official guidebook. Oh, okay. so it's the whole. It's like Mortal Kombat character selection. It does look like that. Oh, that's awesome. Is there? A, yeah. a, do they have a Stardom video game? So they, there's bonus content in uh, Fire okay, Pro okay. Wrestling. So one day I'll check it out. But um, um, yeah, yeah. This weekend or this week, I am I'm doing a bunch of work. I've had like a fucking crazy. I feel like the, every month this year has been so fucking crazy that like I'm excited to just. I'm going to like work every day until the end of the month. And then April, I will have like a normal work schedule instead of being like, I'm going to go live in the woods for two and a half weeks and then like work every day for two and a half weeks. Uh, it doesn't feel like a healthy balance. So I'm trying to get back to healthy balance, but um, yeah, finishing up some stuff for crew, finish up Jane dev uh, uh, the Patreon for, we have a free Patreon for crew as well. Go check that out and uh, yep. subscribe to it. And we'll be doing some cool behind the scenes shit. Um, and yeah, probably going to work all day and then get like uncomfortably high and watch Iron Chef tonight. That's my plan. Hell yeah. yeah. See, that sounds like a good evening. You want to come over? Yeah. Please. Right. Can yeah, I? Yeah, come on. I was looking at flights to go to California for an uh, unannounced documentary because you were like, we're renting a boat. And I'm like, hey. Dude, you should. I, I would like to. I also want to come fucking visit you. Well, we have to chill. I've never met Jesse in person. If you're listening to the podcast, dude, no, see, still. never. We were supposed yeah. to true. E3 last year or the year before oh, yeah. when it got canceled because they don't want me to go to California. That's Tokyo the whole reason. Game oh, Show. Tokyo. Yeah, ooh, oh, dude. ooh, boys trip Tokyo. Yes, let's do it. Let's let's make let's it happen. Go. No clip takes over Tokyo. Let's do it. All right, I'm in. <laughs> All right, that's the pod. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for being here, Danny. Get well, be better. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.